Okay, it is 7.03. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board, uh, Wednesday, February 5th, 2020. We're in the town room, town hall, and uh, we're gonna start right off with item one, minutes, which I believe we don't have any minutes. No minutes. We do not. Item two, this is a time, it's public comment period. This is a time for anyone who's here for something besides something on our agenda that they can come forward and make a statement. Um, I see no hands, so none this evening. Um, we're gonna have a change of schedule. We're gonna change, instead of moving on to item three, we are going to move to item seven, new business. Number A, which is chapter 61A, withdrawal request, property of the, is that Zalza? Zala. Zala. Zala? Zala. Zala. Zala Real, uh, Realty Trust, land on Sunderland Road, Accessors Map 2A, Parcel 7. And we're going to start with the Director of Planning, Christine Bestrup, who's going to fill us in on some of the background, and then we will have the presentation by the applicant. Um, good evening. I'm Chris Bestrup, Planning Director, and I just wanted to give a little bit of context to this request that's going to be made. Um, the property um, that is being requested to come out of Chapter 61A is in the Professional Research Park um, Zoning District. And there are three such zoning districts <coughs> in town. And I just wanted to help you to locate those. So I've got three maps. And um, this is all I'm going to do. And then I'm going to um, take my little thumb drive out. And Mr. Reedy, Tom Reedy, is going to use this port to make his presentation on behalf of the owner, uh, the owner and purchaser of the property. So the first um, PRP zone that I'm gonna show you is the one in North Amherst, and this is the one that is being considered um, tonight. The property in question, sorry about that. <coughs> property in question is along Sunderland Road. It's almost up at the northern end of town. It's this northernmost property in the PRP zoning district. This sort of um, army green, if you would, or olive green um, color here, that's all professional research park. So there are certain uses that are allowed there and certain uses that aren't. Um, so that is professional research park in North Amherst. The next one will be, um, let me go out of this one. Oh dear, what did I do? The next one will be the Professional Research Park on Belchertown Road. So again, the area in the olive green is the Professional Research Park in Bel all along Belchertown Road. Here's Belchertown Road. This is the Logtown neighborhood. This is the, um, this is the entry to Echo Hill. And here's Rolling Green. So this is all PRP. Much of this PRP is wet. And uh, some of it has been developed. Um, the third PRP we're going to look at is, how do I get back to the uh, file, I guess this way. Okay, so the third one we're going to look at is on Northampton Road. Um, Northampton Road is Route 9, so here's Route 9. Here's University Drive, um, and here is Snell Street. So this area in here, I think this is called Holly Meadows Apartment Complex. This whole area here that is in the olive green is in the PRP zoning district. Um, now, most of this is developed for housing currently, and housing isn't allowed in the PRP, but that was allowed back at the time when this um, development was built. So I just wanted to give you a sense that the PRP zoning districts are limited in Amherst. There really isn't much PRP. Do you have any questions about these areas before I pull this um, thumb drive out and Mr. Reedy starts his presentation? David. Yeah, yes, please, Chris. Can you just outline and the, that PRP zone and, and the um, street names that form that border, please? So this is Northampton Road. It's called Russell Street in mm -hmm. Hadley. It's Northampton Road in Amherst. Um, here is University Drive. Uh, there's a Chinese restaurant on the corner here uh -huh. and a real estate office here and a um, veterinarian's office here. And then uh, University Drive branches off into Snell Street, which um, heads on 
towards South Pleasant Street eventually. Um, so are people oriented to this map? Yes. Yep. Okay. The bike path is going back. The bike path goes through here. Yep. So do you have any other questions about the PRP zoning districts? Um, just on the one that we're discussing tonight, the three properties below the one we're discussing, could you just tell us what's on those properties? And it looks like there's a few little triangle pieces on the west side of Sunderland. Is that part of the PRP? That's part of the PRP as well. I think there's a house on one of these properties, um, a greenhouse, dark greenhouse. You probably remember it. And the other two I don't really remember. The other properties here are, for the most part, open, but there is um, a solar project. And I'm trying to figure out exactly where that is. I think. Um, it, this, this, this one here. Okay, so there's a big solar installation, solar panel installation right on this property here. And the other properties, as far as I know, are undeveloped. Undeveloped, like farm or? Um, farm, like forest, open space. Okay, a mix, thank there, you. There are, a couple of, there are a couple of large ponds in that area somewhere. Do you, do you yep. know where they are? Right here. There, there's a big okay. pond here. And there's a big pond here, which I think is connected by a little stream, two ponds connected by a stream. Any other questions? Is that it? Is that it? Okay, so I'm going to pull this thumb drive out. If we need it, we can always get back to it later. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So now we will have a representation for the applicant to come forward. Please introduce yourself for the minute taker. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, members of the board. For the record, Tom Reedy, an attorney with Bacon Wilson here in Amherst. I think it might be useful just to get the GIS map up as well. Pictures are good. Always. Okay. Um, so this is the parcel, the one that it's highlighted in yellow, the parcel that we're talking about. Uh, it is about a 39-acre parcel altogether. There is really only potentially nine acres that are developable on the parcel right here in the middle. Um, I can pull up an overlay map so you, or an aerial map so you can see what it looks like. Um, this middle area right here, probably about four acres of it, I think it has been farmed, or maybe five acres has been farmed. Um, in the past, I'm not sure of the crop. Uh, as far as I know from the Jala family, uh, it's called, they call it the island because everything else around it is really, really wet. And I'll show you a, we went through a uh, resource area delineation with the Conservation Commission, so I think that will show you exactly how wet that site is. Historically, and maybe a little bit more than you, you want to know, but I'll probably tell you anyways, is all of this land was connected all the way over into Hadley. Um, there's a piece of land on the other side of 116 in Hadley that the town has recently acquired. Um, it's, it's in Amherst, but it's on the other side of Sunderland Road that the town acquired that was owned by the Jala family. They owned all of this. They owned probably 200 some odd acres. Sunderland Road historically went all the way north right in front of this property. And then when the state came, I think it was in 1958, and put in 116, it, it somewhat acted as a, a dam, because if you look at some of the historical photographs of this area, um, you're not necessarily going to see the ponds the way they are now. I think I can probably get to... Oh, well, maybe I'm a liar. Um, so it looks like there is a pond there, but at least there, there is some developability or, or farming could occur in this area. Um, and so there, there you see pre-116 where Sunderland Road went. 
And so fast forward to 2004, 2005, you'll see what they had for farmland. I don't want to make everybody sick by zooming in and out. It was really just this area right here. And then when I put this USB in, I think you'll be able to see exactly what, you know, the extent of the wetlands. So let me... So to orient you, this is Sunderland Road here, 116 is right here. Everything in this green kind of triangular area, that's all wetlands. So all of this is wetlands here. There is an existing farm road that accesses this area, but that's, I, even though uh, all of this is wooded over here, all that had been farmed is this area here. And so the Jala family entered into a, an agreement with uh, Sunderland Road North um, to sell the property. They had been, somebody wanted to put solar on it. Uh, we had been approached by uh, folks who wanted to connect into the substation and put solar on it, but understanding um, not having a lot of PRP land and ultimately the, the purchasers of the property want to put something on this land that is allowed in the PRP. I think that that's one of, that's one of the ideas. I don't know what it'll be, um, but that's what they're looking to do. And so because we're in Chapter 61A, which as most of you know is a tax classification that allows for lower taxes, um, as a result of it being an ag agricultural use, one of the um, keys is when you look to convert it to industrial, commercial, or residential use, you have to give the town a right of first refusal. And so the town has that right of first refusal. What you do is you send notices to the planning board, the board of assessors, the conservation commission, the decision makers, so town council plus uh, the town manager in this town, and then the, the um, state forester to look at it as well. And so we've done that. The town has 120 days to either exercise or not. Uh, and so this is just part of the process for your review and whether or not there is a recommendation, and I don't want to steal anybody else's thunder, but a recommendation or not to that decision-making authority to waive or not uh, that right of first refusal. And so that's, that's what we're here for. And we're requesting that you waive it, um, but obviously happy to have a discussion. So you're ready for questions? Me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. OK. Um, I see one, Maria. What are the parallel lines that run through those two green ones? Yeah, good question. Uh, it's an easement. So it's an electric easement. So you'll see that um, the substation is right here. I think they call it the Podunk substation, um, maintained by the utility company. So that's, and they have a utility easement that goes through the property, I believe there are utility high tension wires. I think you can see uh, maybe some of the bases. Uh -huh. Janet, what 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 crops have been grown on that? I, I mean, they're they're it's in farm use now, right? So when I went out there last fall, I didn't see anything growing out there. Um, it's it's really only in this area. Um, I didn't ask the owner what was growing out there, but I don't think it's, there's probably about four or five acres that can be farmed, which, I mean, I think given some of the other farmland in, in the area, frankly, wasn't that meaningful. I mean, to the, these landowners also own the other side of Sunderland Road, which they've recently sold to Kestrel Trust. Um, and so I think that was 180 acres, 150 acres maybe, of farmland. Um, so this was just there. Go ahead. Is the existing farm road the only feasible vehicular access to the buildable portion of the site? It is. And, and following on that question, uh, if the property were to be developed, uh, that existing farm road would probably not be satisfactory for continued development, so we'd have to have a wetland crossing issue and those kinds of things, correct? You're right on top of it, Mr. Bert Russell. Yes, uh, that's exactly. So what we had here was the, um, 
SWCA is the one that did the, let me try to get down there for you, I'm sorry. SWCA did the delineation, and so the, we looked at what that impact would be to get uh, that road to a width that would be um, meaningful so that you could actually have you know, construction traffic and, and vehicular traffic traveling back and forth. I think that's either 26 or 28 feet. My eyes are failing me a little bit. And so the, the permanent impact would be uh, 2,800 square feet of permanent wetland disturbance. Uh, there's a, there's a, a beaver pond. There are beavers here that are creating a backup. That's, I think that's what's causing a lot of the flooding in, in, the, in this area. Um, there is an existing culvert. Um, we were out there with Beth Wilson last year to just discuss it because they were, they were doing, the purchasers were doing due diligence. And so this would have to come up to a, a stream crossing that met the Massachusetts stream crossing standards. And one other question, if you could go back to the lo larger view of the property, uh, that uh, section in the uh, upper right hand corner of that axe head up there, what, what's that, what is that? Is there anything up there that's buildable or is that all wetland too? It's a good question. I, I, would be, I would bet based upon the topography that there is something up here that could be used, but I don't know that it is buildable. You know, I don't know that somebody would access, traverse the entire site, build a road and go here specifically for you know, something, a, a standalone lot. It might be if this is developed something accessory or tangential or could be utilized in conjunction with. Um, but I think also, you know, you've got uh, Montague Road right here and you've got neighbors and so the further you can stay away from them, typically the more likely you are to have a successful, successfully permitted project. Uh, so that's, topographically it looks like it's okay. I think the wetlands will end. You can kind of see if you follow this hand where it looks like they end. You can also see where there's an existing, looks like another, the existing farm road goes across that wetland as well. But again, you're getting into, maybe um, with wetlands, if you alter, permanently alter more than 5,000 square feet, you're dealing with the Army Corps of Engineers. And if you're dealing with the Army Corps of Engineers, you've got to wait a couple of years for your project to actually be approved and built. And so really the key is to stay under 5,000 square feet. My guess is you may exceed that if you wanted to have something you know, accessible to the public. If you kept it as a farm road and had it as 12 feet wide and didn't really, weren't really impactful, you probably don't cross that 5,000 square foot threshold. So I think other than something is, like I say, accessory or used in um, combination with, there's really not much uh, back here that's useful. Question for Chris. Yes. Uh, is this property of any particular value from a conservation or other long-term master plan point of view? Um, this property really isn't next to any conservation land. Um, it's across the road from conservation land that the Kestrel Trust has purchased, um, but it's not really next to or contiguous with any other conservation land. Um, and I, I don't see um, any particular reason why the town would want to acquire it at this time, but you could ask that question of Mr. Zomek. He might be a little bit better able to answer that question. And um, Mr. Zomek is the conservation um, director, director of conservation, and also the director of conservation and development. So you may wish to ask him that question. And maybe if I could, before Dave starts, if you look at the utility map in town, you'll see that water and sewer service end right here, and they don't extend to the site. So any development would necessarily include the extension of that water and sewer to this site, which does a couple of things. It, extends it to these sites, the, the Patterson sites, which are currently used for solar. Solar obviously is a temporary um, use. I mean, after 20 years, 25 or 30 years, it's uh, likely not to exist on our property anymore. So by the extension of that water and sewer, I think you are increasing the likelihood or the value of these 
properties and, and them actually being developed for PRP or some other use. So just something to note. So th thank you very much. Dave Zomack, Director of Conservation and Development, Assistant Town Manager. And I think, I think Christine and, and Tom have covered a lot of it. Um, the question about, so just a little bit more on context, so, um, and Chris can help me out here, but um, this property has been zoned PRP probably going on 30 years or so. If you look back at various plans that the town has put forth, um, including the open space and recreation plan of which this is probably the, I'm gonna guess the fourth or fifth um, update of the open space and recreation plan. The area um, uh, uh, east of Sunderland Road, which is all PRP in this area, has never been identified as a high priority for open space preservation. Um, instead, what the town through the years has done is prioritized everything west of 116. And as Tom said earlier, um, late in 2019, the town did pick up about 23 acres of the Zala property here, which is uh, really sandwiched between Podic Conservation Area here and um, Catherine Cole Sanctuary there. I just switched this over. Um, so just to give you a little context, this is a very sensitive mouse. There we go. So this gives you a little sense. Here is the, the 39 acre parcel. Um, and so over here to the west of 116 is in green conservation area, green conservation area. This is actually coded incorrectly. This is an APR, an agricultural preservation restriction now, so preserve farmland. And we haven't quite coded this, but this is all protected land as well. So in short, the town has prioritized the farmland, the higher quality farmland to the west of 116, and really, <coughs> from a conservation standpoint, stayed away from the PRP. Um, I will note also, and Tom can correct me on this, but I believe that this area is also not listed as an area of um, priority or estimated habitat for rare or endangered species. So that's another uh, reason why it is not listed as a high priority in the open space and recreation plan, so. Janet. So um, I have a couple of questions. Um, first of all, why would the lands west of 116 be like ID'd as priority lands versus the ones east? Um, for a couple of reasons. One is that the soils are better west of 116 and that area, historically, I mean, some of these preservation projects go back long before most of us were volunteering or working for the town, but 25 or 30 years. And so um, from a contiguous uh, uh, parcel standpoint, the town really said, how can we preserve as many parcels that are contiguous farmland as possible? And that's why my predecessor, Pete Westover, began to build on that uh, going back to the 80s, so protecting land west and not focusing on this area here. And, and again, I was not privy to those conversations 20, 30 years ago, but I think earlier planning boards, earlier conservation commissions, staff decided that really this was an area that was to be zoned PRP and that it was not to be um, prioritized as uh, important for uh, conservation or agricultural preservation. The soils on the Zala property, the Patterson property, and the Mitchell properties, um, by and large, are not as good as proper uh, as soils to the west of 116 and then over into Hadley. So, um, the, for the properties that are east, have they been assessed in some kind of formal way in terms of like? the soils are delineated, the wetlands have values, they've been assessed for endangered species, or, you know, like, has there been, like, a formal evaluation process? Well, typically, there's been no formal process, but through the years, various CONCOMs, planning boards, staff members have looked at a lot of those factors. Scenic values, uh, rare and endangered species habitat is mapped by the state, so we can turn on those layers and you see that those areas in the PRP 
do not contain any rare and endangered species that we know of. Um, there are intermittent streams, but not perennial streams. So there's a number of layers of factors that go into whether an area is prioritized or not. And so through the years, that was really the conclusion. And to be honest, the town taking a proactive step to say, this is one of the, um, again, this was 30 years ago, this is one area that we would like to direct development to if sometime in the future, uh, the time is right to do that. As Tom said, um, water and sewer has not been extended all the way up Sunderland Road yet, and that's something that the town has considered through the years. Do you think it has any scenic value or value as farmland, that, that whole section? Um, we've looked at the soils. The soils are not of the highest quality that we would typically um, prioritize in, in ways that we have other farmland. Um, there's a lot of places, honestly, that have scenic value. I grew up in North Amherst, so yeah. clearly there's a lot of areas that have scenic value in North Amherst. Um, that typically isn't, it is one of many factors that we consider when we uh, look at open space preservation. I, I have to say that during my tenure as in, in this position, we've really tried to drill down and say what are the true priorities. <coughs> and I think looking on the east side of Sunderland Road and the west side, the Zala property to the west was surrounded by protected open space. It made sense. When we're, when we're putting together a puzzle and the west is mostly preserved land, it makes sense to fill in. This, is these, this 23 acres here was one of the last puzzle pieces on the western side. This is actually already protected uh, as an APR. So we're finishing the puzzle over here. Um, by and large, we're not likely to go here um, because it has been zoned PRP for 30 years. And it makes sense to have some areas to direct development that the town might want. So, um, do you, so do you think it has scenic value? Because I mean, it's kind of a beautiful stretch, as far as I'm concerned. And the other question is, have you checked with the CONCOM and the Farm Commission the to see what they con think? The Conservation Commission will be taking this up a week from today, the Chapter 61. And the Farm Commission? The Agricultural Commission. Thank you. Um, would they consult it? We typically don't directly consult with the Agricultural Commission. There's nothing statutorily that says they need to sign off on a Chapter 61. It's really a recommendation, a review and recommendation from the Planning Board and a review and recommendation from the Conservation Commission. Could you do that? Um, I will say we didn't talk about dates, but in fact, the 120 days for this expires on March 6th. So. There may not be time, but if they meet during February, happy to take that to them. I don't know when they meet off the top of my head. Yeah, we just, okay. Chris. I just wanna note that um, there is a purchase and sale agreement on this property, so if the town were to decide to purchase the property, um, the, the cost of it would be $400,000. So um, that would have to be appropriated. Doug? Is it true of Chapter 61 property that when it's returned to or taken out of that category that there's some portion of back taxes that are due? And if so, what, what, what is that quantity of money? Yeah, so um, you're correct. There is a either a conveyance tax or a rollback tax depending upon when the property is being conveyed out and when it was put into chapter classification. And so in this case, it would be rollback taxes. And what the assessor does is looks at the past five years, what it would have been assessed at, at its highest and best value, and then what it paid for taxes over the past five years. I, I think that totals maybe $13,000 over the past five years, according to, that was according to Dave Burgess um, before he left. I guess maybe one point on the, uh, the scenic nature of it. Um, if you've been out to the site, you'll see that along 116, there's a, a bunch of trees, a row of trees, and then there's wetlands and then more trees, and you're not gonna be able to take down any of those trees because of their existence in the wetlands. So it's not like you can, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about scenic views to the west, and I don't know if that's what you're thinking about here, um, you're not gonna be able to get those. You would have to actually go internal to the site 
and then you would be dealing with, you know, you're surrounded by uh, wetlands, trees, uh, and a, a beaver pond to the west. So just something to consider if you're thinking about the westerly views, which is a little different than, say, well, the Mitchell property here, which, you know, slopes topographically from the east to the west, but also has um, more views because there's less, if, if not many, trees on this side. So you don't think a building would be seen kind of thing, or...? I think it would be, I think it would be tucked away. I mean, it's, um, I wouldn't suggest actually driving in there because it's pretty <laughs> mucky now. Yeah. Uh, but it, I mean, that, that building would be tucked away, which is part of the attractiveness of this site, is that it, it, it's nestled in a way that um, hopefully is out of the eyesight of the Montague Road folks and then is tucked far enough back where if you're traveling on 116, your, your eye isn't immediately drawn to it. If, if you're familiar with how to get into the site, it really is off of this kind of elbow right here of Sunderland Road. Um, and then, like I said, there are all those, maybe I'll pull up the aerial map again, there's all those trees right along here, and then another buffer right along here, and then all of this is wetlands that'll just continue to, to grow up. I, I live near there, I drive by all the time, and um, it's, I've never even noticed that that field is in there because of the way the topography is. It, it, it goes down to the wetlands, but then it sort of comes up and, mm -hmm. and then it rises up behind, wh which is sort of a fist up there. You can't see many of the homes. But um, analyzing the numbers you gave, it sounds like you're saying that it would, it would impact less than 25%, like the maximum. If you said the max is buildable nine acres, so it could be potentially 20% or less is actually developed, so it's still leaving a lot of the green and scenic beauty. Yes. Okay. Uh, and just one for uh, Ms. Somek. So are you saying, like, so this is basically like weighing the value for the town. So of course there's the important green, you know, saving green space element, and that's a value, but we have limited PRP land, so it sounds like the town is not taking an active um, role in trying to obtain this property because when you put it on the scale. Yeah, uh, so in short, um, con consulting with Chris, consulting with other staff, um, my recommendation to the Conservation Commission next week will be that we not acquire this property for agricultural preservation or conservation purposes. As I said before, um, you know, during my tenure, we have really tried to focus our attention on the highest priority parcels remaining that are unprotected in Amherst. And yes, there are some trade-offs. There's some scenic value here. There's there's some, some wildlife habitat. Is there a, there's wildlife habitat on every piece of property, you know, including where we all live. But as Tom said, uh, only about 9%, or excuse me, 9 acres of 39 will be developed. So uh, the remaining land, for the most part, will be left to grow. It's protected wetland, much of it. Um, so the Conservation Commission, through their powers, will make sure that if somebody develops this, that that land uh, remains in, in roughly its natural state. So this is not a recommendation that I would make for preservation to you or to the Conservation Commission. Now again, I don't speak for the Commission, so they may have a different opinion next week and they, they will write an independent recommendation to the Council as well. But I will make, um, a, or answer questions and make a similar statement to them. I'll go with David first. Well, I, I, would, I, would, I would propose a motion, but so if there are other questions or discussion. Um, how about, I'll go with. Okay. So, I, I, so um, does the planning board normally wait until they hear from the ConCom for what the val their thing is? Because I, you know, I was thinking I'd like to hear from the Conservation Commission and then the Farm Commission, the Agricultural Committee, to see what they say, because I don't feel quite equipped to make a decision since we're, we're kind of a broad-based board and we're supposed to be looking at farmland protection and scenic and developable land and all those kind of things, I'd like to hear from those committees first. Is that normal? Um, so in my long tenure of four years here, uh, 
this has never come up before, but um, I saw a nod no from Chris that that isn't. Um, I am not aware of any time that the Planning Board has waited to hear from the Conservation Commission about okay. a request for release of Chapter 61A um, property. And, and I've been here for 15 I, I years. I agree. I think there's different agendas and different roles and charges for each um, board or commission. Uh, David, did you have, or well, Doug? Doug. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. I had two questions. Um, at the moment, I can only remember the first. So the, the question that I have is, are the priorities for open space and undeveloped land development uh, preservation known? Or is that, uh, like, you say this is low on the uh, priority list. Is the list publicly available? Or do we, do we hold that because we don't really want to tip our hand? Go ahead. Um, so we publish, we publish an open space and recreation plan. We're obligated by the state to, require by the state to update that every five to seven years. We did an update in 2017, 18. It's our most yeah. recent update. Um, it is online, it is available to anyone. And um, there you will see, because I refresh my, my own memory on it, there is a, very large circle uh, around that land to the west of 116 and really nothing identified in that area. So we identify uh, high priority areas for uh, wildlife habitat, forestry, intact forests, um, um, river, river corridors, um, estimated and priority habitat, and of course, um, priority blocks of farmland all in that document. Did you remember I the remembered second? the second Go one, for it. <laughs> which is just sort of a process question. Uh, if we had 120 days of deliberation on this, and it's now, there's 30 days uh, before the end of that period, has the, the planning board's agenda been so busy that this wouldn't have come up before? I can definitely say yes. <laughs> David? So my understanding is that <clears throat> it's actually, the town council's role mm -hmm. to okay. is authorized by statute to make this decision. And the decision is whether to exercise the right to purchase the, the right of first refusal, right, mm -hmm. to purchase the property instead of the, uh, um, Mr. Reedy's client. And so it's, it's just, it's the planning board's recommendation, just like it's any of these other mm -hmm. bodies, commissions. I'd like to make a, I would make a motion that the planning board recommend to the uh, town council that it not exercise its right um, to purchase this property, that it allows this purchase to go through. Second. Our second, we'll have some discussion. Does anyone have some comments or questions? I'll give it a minute. Uh, I don't. So I just, just okay. following up on Mr. Marshall's question. So do we normally get this very early in the process and this is coming late? Is, there, is, some, is there a process? I mean, just <laughs> so. So it came in in early November. Um, what we do is we send it off to town council and town council evaluates it and then gets back to us and lets us know whether it has followed all the right processes to get to us, which includes various types of mailings and um, format and it has to have all its parts and pieces. So our town attorney did get back to us and say, yes, it is in the right format. Then we had, um, what did we have? A planning board meeting after Thanksgiving, I think. Or no, we had one before Thanksgiving. Before. Which was the 20th, so we probably hadn't heard by the 20th. And we had two very, um, very full um, meetings in December. Yeah. Um, so far we had one meeting in January and then a and then kind of a lightweight meeting in January. So this is the first meeting in February that we've had an opportunity to um, review this. And so. Do I have any other questions? I see none. Um, should I have, do we have to have public comment on this? Okay. 
is there anyone here who would like to speak on this? Yeah, I don't see anyone. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. Come, come on up, please. Thank you. And if you could please just introduce yourself for the minute taker. <clears throat> Dorothy Pam, town councilor. Is this anything to do with the eruptor? Are you in your here in your capacity as town councilor, or are you in here as your capacity as a citizen? I I think it's a question that I would want to know as a town councilor and a citizen. So we were told there was a possibility of some land somewhere in this area, but I had no idea where. So I was just wondering if th this was a spot where it might go. I don't know. I don't know if Mr. Reedy has any information on that. Okay. Do I go back? The erupt, it's, um, they're talking about building, it's like a, not a think tank, but we, uh, Sure, so a, maybe a, a unveiling a little bit. It's a research and development with kind of proof of concept light manufacturing facility that has been, rumblings of which has been in the works for, I think, a couple of years at this point, and they are looking to be sited in, in North Amherst in this general area, but that is not the intent of Okay. Whether it be, Thank you. what I'll say is whether it becomes it, I don't know, but that is not what the purchaser has in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else have a question? I see none. So um, at this point, we can take a vote. Um, but the motion, do we have the motion written down? Um, all in favor, show of hands. I see, um, I'm like, we're missing. Got one, two, three, four, five. Uh, against and abstain. abstain. Okay, so we have five, zero, one. Thank you so much for coming. Good luck. Thank you. And I think we see you next again. <laughs> You're just going to stay gonna, there. I'm okay. just going to sit right here. <laughs> So we will move um, backwards on our agenda, back to item three, and I do have a preamble to read. Okay, so it is 745. In accordance with the provisions of MGL 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted. This hearing is being held for the purpose of providing an opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2020-05-462 Main Street, LLC, uh, Center East Commons, 462 Main Street, continued from January 15th. So, request uh, to modify previously issued site plan review approval SPR 2020-01 to change the unit configuration of the mixed-use building to add more one-bedroom and studio apartments to increase the number of units from 16 to 24 to increase the building footprint by approximately 800 square feet um, <clears throat> Excuse me, and the building size by a total of approximately 2,700 square feet to adjust the location of certain site improvements to rebuild the back section of the existing office building and to request waivers, uh, waivers of the parking requirements, modifications requested so as to be in compliance with conditions one and seven of the decision for SPR 2020-01, BN Zoning District, map 14B, parcel 68. And uh, let's see here. So, and in opening the public hearing for SPP 2020-02-462 Main Street, LLC, Center East Commons, 462 Main Street to run concurrently with SPR 2020-05 public hearing. In accordance with the provisions of MGL 40, Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted. This hearing is being held for the purpose of providing an opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPP 
462 Main Street, LLC, Center East Commons, 462 Main Street. SPP 2020-02-462 Main Street, LLC, 462 Main Street, Center East Commons, request to alter, enlarge, or construct a portion of a pre-existing non-conforming structure, BN Zoning District, Map 14B, Parcel 68. Whew, that was longer than I thought it was gonna be. <laughs> okay, sorry, everyone awake? Are there any board disclosures? I see none. Uh, we are going to have a presentation by the applicant. Welcome back, if you could both introduce yourselves for the minute taker. Chris. Um, I just wanted to note that yeah. these two public hearings are running concurrently. The special permit application came in after the site plan review application, but um, they're running concurrently now, so you can discuss them both together. But you will have to make separate decisions. And separate votes, yeah. That's separate what, votes and, and findings. And the whole findings. Thank you. Okay. Great. Welcome. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, <laughs> members of the board. For the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson here mm -hmm. in Amherst, here on behalf of 462 Maine. And with me this evening is the manager and member of 462 Maine, John Robleski. Uh, so last we were here, um, a little shy of a month ago, January 15th, uh, we had a, uh, I thought it was a very productive discussion. We went away with some homework, and now we're back, hopefully, to provide you with the results of, of that homework. I think you should have in your packet um, the letter from Jason Skeels. I think you also have a, a clean letter, I would say, from Jason Skeels, a, a clean letter from the fire department relative to the propane tanks. Uh, you have an updated management plan, an updated additional information to the management plan, and then you have a parking management plan as well. Um, and I think what we would like to do this evening is talk through the special permit piece of it um, and really just explain what we're asking for here. And I, we would suggest that it's more of a technicality than anything else and that you can make the finding. And then uh, we'll have Christine Royal, uh, the architect, talk through those changes after the discussion that we had last time, and then we can show you some of the updates we made to the plan, specifically relative to the landscaping um, in front of those parking spaces, if you'll recall. And so maybe turning first to the special permit, which um, hopefully is the, hopefully it's all simple, but hopefully it's a nice simple piece of it. What we're looking to do is there is an existing structure on the site, as you're all aware. Uh, it's shown on the screen here, 462 Main Street. It currently, um, located in the BN zoning district, side yard setback is uh, 10 feet. There is, in your dimensional table, a waiver under footnote A. However, in I think it's 6.132, there is a provision <coughs> that says it has to be 10 feet away from uh, the side lot line. And so this structure is not 10 feet away. And it existed closer to that side line before the zoning was changed and therefore is pre-existing non-conforming. It's a pre-existing non-conforming structure. And so what Mr. Robleski is looking to do is to take down this piece and to rebuild it and to go no closer to the lot line than it currently is. Essentially take it down, put it right back up, but it will be new. Um, and I think there's a few good reasons to do that. And so your finding needs to be that him doing that is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing uh, location off of the side lot line. And we would suggest that it's not. So that's, that's what's existing. And then I'll scroll down. And I can show you it as well after. And so that's what's proposed. So it's this portion right here that is coming down and, and effectively being repurposed but not going any closer to the lot line. And so I've got, for more visuals, here is that area that's going to come down. You can see on the back here what's coming down and then where it's going back up and, and what is going back up in its place. And so I think we discussed this last time but this is just the technical means to get to where we need to get to. And so we would suggest that you could make the finding that it's not substantially more, it's not more detrimental at all, let alone substantially more detrimental. So if, I don't know if you want to take the special permit now and discuss it or how you want to do it, but just I, I think it's probably the low hanging fruit here. Do people have questions on this? Michael? I do. Um, 
what does the, uh, edi uh, the repurposed edition, whatever we want to call that little section, look like from the side of the abutters? Um, Are there any windows on that back side, John? <clears throat> there is one window there. Yeah. And there will continue. Will it look the same as it does now? It will. The only difference is, um, as you can see in the existing photo there, Trailer is part. You know, if you remember, people that went out to the site visit, that, that portion of the building is just set on stone right. and loose brick, and that's why it's sagged that much. So it will be rebuilt in that same spot with one window on the back. So yes, from looking at the abutter side, it's not going to look any different other than the extension of the roof for the bike cover. Which will also be closer to the light, lot line well, than is currently allowed. That, where the bike cover is actually, it's, it's going to be pretty close to the 10 feet. The front of the, exist, front of the existing house is 4.9 feet, almost 5 feet, and the south end of the house mm -hmm. is, you go back to the previous map right there, and then the back, the back corner is 9.5 feet, so 9 feet 6 inches. So the farther it goes back, those lines spread, okay. so it's pretty close to the 10 feet at that point. But it's... it's it's parallel with this, that side of the building. Correct. Right. But not parallel to the property line is what you're saying. Right. So, so that covered bike shelter, if where it begins is 9.5, I see what you're saying. By the time you get to the northern edge of it, you're at yeah, 10 feet. So it's nine. a little triangle, you're saying, a, a sliver of that covered bike shelters in this, within the 10 foot buffer. Uh, Maria? Um, that perspective you showed kind of shows how the lower left one will, sh that basically is the view from the butters sort of mirrored in a way because it looks like it's, a, you know, you see the shed, you see the little gable roof. The only issue, I, and I agree, you're not really going that much closer to, you're not making it more non-conforming in other words. Um, I guess the only thing is if there's lighting for those bikes under the, sh the sort of open area, yep. Is there, I don't remember this, the, the light sort of map, but um, is there gonna be spillage to the abutters? Or, I mean, I'm sure it's downcast, but before, you know, it was just the structure, but now you have a covered bike storage area, which I assume you know, Actually, light. yeah, there is gonna be, and you know, a lighting plan shows that, um, just recessed lights or, you know, lights on the ceiling that are just pointing down. Currently, there's a spotlight on that okay. back door there. Hmm. which is, you know, kind of shine. So actually the lighting to the neighbors will be improved. Oh. And is that a six-foot fence that runs along it's between about six the and a half. Six and a half, okay. Yeah. Janet? I'm having a little trouble. So in the top picture on the left, what's that thing in the corner? Is that like a trailer or something? Is it is a trailer. It just belongs to um, that photo was used because it kind of gave the right angle to superimpose the new addition on. It's not there, it hasn't been there for like two years. Okay. It, it was a trailer for Crossman Properties. And it, so when we go to the new picture right below it, is that trailer still there? Yeah, just only because of the way they superimpose yeah. it. And I don't know, maybe Chris knows yeah. how Photoshop <laughs> works or something. And that's why it looks kind of yeah. out of place where it's set, but there's no other way, I guess, to show the roof line and how it meets. She used it as the base and, and then and just so, put the rendering on it. So if you took the trailer away, could the person in the next door backyard see the bikes? What? No. Okay, so there's like, <clears throat> there's like a wall? It's, well, this there's is a very, six I mean, and I'm, a half foot fence there. Okay, That's the and then the other question I have, just partly for the visual confusion, is does the, um, so there's a roof line for the little little house, and then in, for the bike shelter, it doesn't go, the build, it's not any long, bigger than it is now. No, it follows the same roof line that the new, the new structure will. The only difference is the new structure is going to be a little bit higher, like a foot and a half higher, because those walls on the existing I can stand and my forehead touches that gutter <laughs> in the front there, so. So it's, it's just, not any bigger in terms of a roof, or, okay. Correct. It's, it's just yeah, a little hard, have to, a it's hard to see. It's hard to see. stuff. Yeah. Okay. Any other and, questions on this part? I see none. Um, 
Do you want to move to the SPR? Sure. Um, Are there any public comments that, from yeah. that? They can take them now, right? They can take it now or after. But he was just asking about public comment and if you wanted to take it now for the just for um, the special for permit, permit or if you're gonna for the special uh, does anyone here have questions on the special permit? The part I see none. So great. Um so maybe what we can do is talk about architecture and then turn around and talk about maybe management and, and parking after yeah. that, if that's okay. And so I don't know if Christine, you want to talk through some of the changes that you made and maybe what I will do. Would you rather uh, as a board see all three, what was originally approved, what was proposed last time? Oh, yeah, the flippers Mr. here. Mr. Flipper, yeah. yeah. Uh, what, what was approved, uh, proposed, um, and? I, I, if, if, there's a, if that's a genuine question, I'd, I'd just go with what's current, what's the, the latest and the greatest. Perfect. And if we need perspective, we know that you can flip well. <laughs> I agree with that. It's on my resume after the last oh. meeting, too. Good evening. My name is Christine Royal. I'm an architect working with Maple Street Architects out of Northampton. I am a town resident as well. Uh, so based on the committee's feedback from our last meeting, we have adjusted the way that the um, front facade looks facing the The way the front facade looks at the street, um, we did add a window as suggested, which really does help uh, reduce the size of that wall, the green wall that faces the street, gives it some context. Um, we added the low planting shrubbery at the parking spaces that you can see up front. We also had a discussion about the existing uplighting on the sign. So our proposal is to relocate the existing pole light that you can see back by the porch and the stairs to the front, um, mm -hmm, to the front by the low shrubbery and the uh, basically to about right here, so that it'll light both the sign and the entry and the parking, um, and remove the existing uplight that shines on the signage. There was also discussion about the bracket detailing on the existing building. And while it's not shown in this rendering, we have gone through and, and pulled some bracket detailing and reviewed it with uh, the owner to, um, to use as detailing on the wood trim porch of the new proposed, which would be here. Oh, yes. Um, and then you also were wondering about the, the mullion details on the windows, which we've included in the rendering, which was the intention originally, but um, as you had noted, wasn't really uh, visually represented in this. So the, the view from the west, looking at the west facade, has not changed very much, um, but I don't, I don't think that there was really a lot of comment on the way that this had been broken down by proportion and by massing. Oh, the window on the west on unit four. This one. To the right. On the right. My other right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I think some of the comment was Previously, there was nothing here, and it was just a lot of massing, and so there's obviously the addition of that window. Could you just do one flip back? So we can just have one memory of, do you memory see of what, you... what we looked at last time. Okay. Without the, with the massing, you know, without okay. the extra detail, sure. just so we can really go, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you 
Now, did you um, change the windows? I think there were bathroom windows in the back. They're still, you know, small, but they look more robust. Did you put wider trim on them or something? I think when we went through and defined uh, the mullion details on those front bottom windows, mm -hmm. I need to switch. When we redefined these and the rendering, we did the same thing to redefine okay. these as discussed. Yeah, they pop a little more. Mm -hmm. So should I open, are you ready for questions? Um, does the board have any questions on this um, new rendering? Maria. Um, I don't have questions. I just, you know, thank you for the effort in making, you know, the changes. I, I liked the project last week and I think you've actually improved it, just putting a little more scale sort of things and tweaking it. And um, I think that the scale of it fits the adjacent properties and the language. Um, so, but yeah, thank you for, you know, making that extra effort with the changes. It's not really a question. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. We appreciate the dialogue and the feedback that we've received. Okay. Any other questions or comments on this part? All right. Oh, Michael? Um, I have to echo Maria's. Uh, I think it looks much better. Uh, it's amazing what one little change can make, <laughs> yeah. uh, so, from sure. my point of view anyway. It, what it does for me is it separates the front section of the building from the back section of the building, so it again looks like it used to in the original rendering, which was almost like two separate buildings, and now it looks like that again, and thank you. Thank you. So we will move on to the other documents. It could be asked questions. Yeah, if you've got general questions, we're happy to answer them. If you want us to explain the, the parking plan, I know parking came up last time, we're happy to do that. Um, that's exactly what I was oh, thinking. Wow. I noticed you have an addendum too. Those were the, just the two. You have the parking management plan and then you had an addendum. Just yes. if, I wasn't sure, you know, is that an addendum to your application that was, or? No, it, it, it's uh, an addendum to the management plan. So what the bylaw requires is some additional oh, okay. information. And so the last time we had the previous number of units, the, the total number of dwelling units and now that has changed so and the same thing with the number of bedrooms so Ms. Brestrup suggested that and recommended that we update that to reflect what's actually in front of you so that's all we've done is is to update that okay. um, are there any questions from the board on um, any of this additional information provided um, parking spaces or the management plan I see. <coughs> Setting hand up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll go with Michael and then Janet. Um, I, I still um, am concerned about the parking spaces, the number of them. Um, and first of all, um, the. Um, Got to find my notes here. Excuse, forgive me. Um, Yeah, on, um, on page seven of the development application report, um, uh, the, the applicant is proposing 32 parking spaces overall, including 16 compact spaces. Um, as I read this, the uh, zoning bylaw, um, it says 50% of, the, uh, of the standard parking spaces can be. Um, of, 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 um, of cut for compact spaces, but that's um, if you take 50 percent of uh, 29 parking spaces. Sorry, um, where am I? Got to get my math correct here. Um, there, are, there are not 16 uh, full parking spaces if you don't if you take out the um, handicapped spaces. Am I, am I correct in that? There are altogether 32 spaces. Correct. So, and yes, if you, 16 if you of subtract them, the ADA compliance spaces, mm -hmm. which I, but frankly, those are, those are not standard parking spaces. 
I've never. I don't think. Right. I, I mean, I think we have interpreted it as, and in previous projects have interpreted it as if there's a different interpretation. Um, it's it's somewhat news to me that the the standard parking spaces are inclusive of the ADA spaces because they are standard standard ADA, but they are still standard. It is not that. I think the distinction is standard and compact, not necessarily standard standard ADA and and compact. And so the ADA spaces are considered standard. With 32 total standard spaces, half of those would be the 16, which were at that 50% threshold. Well, that's context. one way of reading the, the bylaw. I'm not sure that's the only way or the correct way. In addition, um, holding that in advance, um, I, um, with, uh, with 35 bedrooms and um, um, 25 spaces for residents, um, that seems significantly less than even one space per, um, per unit, per, uh, per bedroom. Um, when the bylaw calls for two spaces per unit, um, so I think we're asking for a, um, a very large waiver here. Uh, and I'm not comfortable with that size of a waiver, given the nature of the, of the building. Um, and the proposed um, occupancy of the building, which still, as I understand it, excludes undergraduates. Um, although I'm, I'm confused about that. Sometimes it says there will be undergraduates. Uh, 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 can, it's available for undergraduates, and sometimes say it's not. So I don't know where we stand on that issue. But either way, uh, it seems to be designed uh, for um, graduate students and young professionals. Um, and um, some of the one-bedroom units and studio units and presumably most, if not all, of the two-bedroom units uh, will have more than one person living in them, presumably. And uh, the likelihood of, of more than one person living in, a, in a, a unit having only one car is, you know, it's likely that that will happen. It's also likely that it may not happen in certain, in certain instances. Two people living in one space frequently have different jobs, go to different places, have different lifestyles in terms of their uh, working relationships, and may in fact need two different cars. Um, so there's a certain logic to having two cars required for a, uh, for a, for a unit. Um, on the one hand, I can understand the notion that well, the market will take care of this. If people want to live here and you know they know that they can't have, they can only have one car, um, and that's it. And so the, the the market the the buyer beware. Uh, on the other hand, uh, and there's a certain logic to that. And I can understand that. But on the other hand, it's uh, part of the board's responsibility. It seems to me to uh, protect potential tenants. Uh, and to provide them with reasonable facilities to ensure that they have reasonable facilities uh, at their disposal. Um, and I, am, I question whether uh, less than one parking space per unit, per, sorry, per bedroom, is a reasonable provision of parking under the, under the conditions that uh, exist in that particular part of town. Uh, I understand there's good bus service there, and I understand you're providing uh, bicycle uh, facilities, and, uh, and uh, many of your residents will take advantage of those. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Amherst is still a town, and it's not a city. Uh, the buses don't go everywhere. You know, the bike will go everywhere if, if you have enough time and energy to ride it anywhere. Uh, but uh, buses and bikes and walking uh, are important in this area, but they are not uh, the end all. Uh, and unfortunately for us in this day and age, maybe not 20 years from now, but now uh, we are in an, area, an era and an area where 
the uh, automobile is important uh, to most people. Uh, and uh, I, I question whether we have enough parking here. That's sort of the end of my statement. <clears throat> Janet, did you have a question? I have, I have, I have, I, well, you are next in the queue. Oh, okay. So, Thank you. so um, then I recognize you. I have my um, section of the bylaw 7.9 on waivers. And I think at the last time we met, I asked you for information and data that would meet the waivers requirement. And so my question is, what is your, give me, if you can give me some information on what you expect people, what kind of your tenants to need in terms of cars. And so um, I can give you a bunch of stats from the master plan I mean, and then from the transportation plan and then some, a few from the PVTA. They're all very discouraging about um, non-car use. And so we, you know, the, the, I assume you're going under, you're trying to, I mean, what part of the waiver provision are you going under when you seek your waiver? I think we're looking at 7.910 where um, you've got two complementary uses. So we've got the um, office, the commercial spaces during the day, and then we have residential at night. So I think not to double count um, is important. And then we're also providing a, a parking management plan. And, and so when you ask what do we think we need, I think what Mr. Robleski is providing is, is what he thinks he needs. And it's, it is based upon what he's seen at his Spruce Ridge project, what he's seen um, at 70 University Drive um, in, in that project. And also looking at just parking utilization and, and typically what you're seeing is about, and I think John's got some data, he went out I think this morning at 4.30 to, to take a look at a bunch of different um, housing projects in the surrounding area and to count the number of cars. And, and he's come up with similar to what you find out of Boston or Cambridge or, or Arlington that there's a 36% I think is the number um, non-utilization rate. So, or put another way, a 64% utilization rate. And when we're looking at what John's providing here, I think the market does help dictate. Um, I think there are uh, a significant number of uh, existing and proposed housing um, for folks who want cars, want two vehicles, um, or don't want any vehicles. I know there are folks who say, I'm not gonna have a car, and that's why I live in Amherst. Um, and if you look at the, the, the bed to parking space ratio, you're at 71%. So that's even above what the utilization rate is, and that's building in you know, the ADA spaces, the EV spaces, and um, I think you've got the guest parking as well. And so I think from, not to speak for John, but to speak for John, from his perspective, he's, he's got sufficient parking, and I think appropriately managed, because I think to a certain extent, I don't respectfully know if it is the planning board's job to look out for the tenants. I think there is a tenant obligation to look. I think if you're looking out for someone, it's probably for the neighbors or the neighborhood to make sure that folks aren't sneaking cars on and parking in the street or parking somewhere where they're not supposed to, and then you've got a hazard for pedestrians and a butters and all, and all of that. And so I think that comes down to management of it and appropriate management to make sure that folks aren't parking where they're not supposed to, uh, that the lease is restrictive enough and, and penal enough where if somebody is doing something they're not supposed to, that <coughs> you let them know and then there's potentially an eviction after that. And so I think, to answer your question long-windedly but as directly as I, I think I know how, it's the 7.9.1, uh, 7.9.10 and 7.912 with the parking management and then the two complementary uses. So I mean, we're happy to get into some of that, those numbers if you'd like to. Um, but I think that's, it's John's sense and position that given everything he knows and given the way it's going to be managed, this is sufficient. So you have data. So, um, and it's based on one morning going around to different. Um, yeah, I, I went this morning at 430 in the morning and drove around, you know, kind of the perimeter of where Center Reese Commons will be. And you know, I'm familiar with what's here as far as other apartments and so forth. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, 13 and 15 High Street is right across the tracks. Um, six new units were built there probably four or five years ago. 
So they have 16 spaces there, but they're not marked out. It's gravel parking. Um, there was eight cars parked there, so that's 50% utilization. Um, my property at 22 High Street, I got 34 spaces, and there was 20 cars parked there at about 4.30 this morning. 70 University Drive, I drove down there, there's 47 spaces, and there was... 25 cars. I'm sorry, there was 34 spaces and 24 being used? 20. 20. No, 20. And there's, how many apartments are in that complex? 12. So in that complex, I have 2.33 spaces per unit. And they've been empty. Like, I went there this afternoon and replaced some parking lot lights, post lights. There were seven cars in the parking lot. So, and there's other data. I've been researching this the past couple of weeks, there's all kinds of information out there as far as parking utilization is being overbuilt in past years and how different areas of, uh, including Massachusetts, are looking at parking for new development. So, and, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, you got um, interrupted. Can you go back to University Drive and the numbers you had there? You were going through your list. Yeah, 70 University Drive, you're familiar with that. There's 47 parking space, there's 60 bedrooms there. Um, 36 apartments, 25 cars were parked there this morning. So that's 46% that's not being used. 622 and 630 Main Street, it's on the corner of Spalding and Main. There's 12 units there. Again, it's not marked out. Um, there was, I figured up enough for like 30 cars there. There's 15 parked there. My property, I have another house, 734 Main Street. I have 10 bedrooms there, three units. I had six cars there. Salem Place. Now, Salem Place is probably a good thing, like um, Mr. Burt was so you're referring to student rentals. I think there's a lot of undergrads there from my past experiences on the police department and so forth. There's 82 parking spaces there and there was uh, 20 that were empty. So that's, you know, a lot more cars were parked there. So that's still left 24% that weren't being used. Aspen Chase, which is between College Street and Main Street. Um, there's 67 bedrooms there, 82 spaces. Uh, there were 16 empty there. So that's some more student rentals there too. They're smaller, one bedroom, one or two bedrooms there, very small. Uh, 683 Main Street, which is Watson Farms, it's a, actually a town project there. Um, I don't know if it's a subsidized project or what, um, but there's some small units there, one bedrooms, and there's some three and four bedroom units there. Uh, there's 52 bedrooms there, 46 parking spaces, there's only 19 cars parked there. So it's 58% unused. The end of Spalding Street, there's um, Eight condos, or they're basically rental units there. 24 spaces, they had 14 cars. 35 High Street, which is right across from Spruce Ridge on High Street. There's 11 units there, 18 spaces, had 11 cars parked there. And then 285 Main Street is the building down here that burned a, few year, a couple years ago and they rebuilt it. Six units in there, 16 parking spaces, there is nine cars. So overall, it's there was 403 parking spaces available and 146 were empty. And this goes with a lot of data that I've been reading. Boston did a, a 20, surrounding Metro Boston, they did 20 communities there and they found 36% of parking spaces in condos and multifamilies were going unused. And I think cities and towns are starting to look at this and say that's space that can be used to create more housing and more return to the cities and towns as far as tax dollars. Providing um, close proximity to transit is a big thing. Governor Baker just signed a thing last month, you know, about uh, it's the transportation and global initiative or something. And part of that is smart parking. And this is what they talk about creating less parking, and some other studies that are out there said if you build more parking, you're going to entice people to get a car. You build less, the idea I guess is to build the amount of parking that 
is going to be used. So, I mean, looking at these figures even from this morning, I think what we're asking for will work. You know, based on next door, based on these other properties. And I think the way we're designing this, part of it goes along with the master plan, by the way, too. From uh, Chapter 9 of Transportation and Circulation, Objective T4 says, AMR should revise its zoning and subdivision regulations to promote infill and direct new development toward appropriate locations and to allow density sufficient to support viable public transit. And I think this is why this particular parcel was included in the BN rezoning back in 2011, somewhere in there. So it kind of fits. And then the other option, if you look long term, is are we going to have you know, rail service here at some point in the future? Is it going to come back? Probably not, but I mean, the tracks are right there. It just it fits the scenario of providing housing, more dense housing, in an area on the outskirts of downtown where public transit's available. And I've got data from the PVTA um, that'll back a lot of things up too. In bikeable area, walkable area, in nine minutes you're right here. Yeah. I spoke with uh, Alex Forrest from the PVTA planning department. Um, and he's aware, I told him there's gonna be possibly 35 more bedrooms here and he's, yeah, that route is already overloaded. If you remember the last meeting, I said one of my tenants was coming over and he, they wouldn't let him on a bus because it was full and he gets a skateboard to go to UMass. But in September of 2019, that stop, they call it the Gray Street, Gray Street stop, the average daily boards was 202 people. So, I mean, this whole neighborhood there uses that. And it's, I think, just, it makes sense for this project to go there for a lot of good reasons, I think. In the way I've got it laid out, Center East Commons just creates a nice, walkable, attractive, and efficient building there. And it's going to serve the tenants well. It's going to serve the businesses that will be located there well. And it creates the infill that I think was part of the mentioning in the uh, master plan. And it's a nice balance of residential business and green space, you know, as part of the redesign, you know, having more green space between the buildings there instead of parking. Um, the bike rack and everything, and it's, it's right next to the PVTA, and I just think it makes sense, and I feel myself that the parking is, is going to work. And as far as, you know, more than one person per bedroom, I've always had a rule of one, one person per bedroom. Um, married couples, obviously, you're going to run into that. Uh, but I've got a married couple next, next door there, and they've got one car. They've got a married couple at 734 Main Street. They've got one car and a bike. So I really feel it, it's, it's very doable and, and it's going to work. I just want to make one quick comment that the study you were referring to was sent to the planning board this week. It's the um, Metro, uh, Metropolitan Boston Perfect Fit Parking Initiative from the MAPC that yeah. just came out in July 2019. Mm -hmm. So it's very current. Um, yeah, and you and were very good about restating most of what, what I was found. In it. What I found interesting is when I added these spaces up later today and divided them into the total available. 36% go unused, the same as Boston area. It, it, well, I noticed that when you read it, but yeah. Um, so I saw Janet's hand and, and then Michael. No, one, can I just <laughs> say one more thing? Um, regarding um, the issue of the uh, two parking space or the 50% compact, um, I'm pretty sure we got an interpretation from Rob on that, that it was a total parking. So it's not, you know, the standard that Mr. Burwistle brought up. It's it's the 50% of the total parking, including handicap, EV station, et cetera. And it makes sense because the cars are much smaller. They're not the old Buick LeSabres, you know, of years ago. So, um, so I appreciate that you did that because I did that one morning to the um, high street thing and most of the spaces were used on a Sunday morning. And so- Sunday morning, yeah, a lot of, you know, sometimes you'll have a guest 
you know, stay overnight or something on the weekends. Yeah, so there were only six empty spaces. So I think that this is actually where I was sort of heading, which is that we need more information about parking use and what are people going to do. So that was like a snapshot. At, yeah, I appreciate that you were up at 4.30 doing that. Mm -hmm. And the transportation plan um, calls for the town to do studies of actual use and need. And after doing those kind of studies, to change the zoning bylaw to adjust, because different parts of town will have different needs. The master plan, like you just said, you know, do basically revise your zoning regulations. And so I think that this issue that you're raising is very critical, um, but, and we just don't have the data. And so, you know, that is a great snapshot. I'd love to see more. Um, so I collected some data um, from, some of it's from the master plan, some from the transportation plan, some from the American Community Survey, some from the PVTA, and some from the assessor's office. Um, in Amherst, only 10% of people use the bus, um, only 3% bike overall. Um, in Amherst Center, 30% walk to work. This is, this is the percentages for people who are commuting. 30% um, walk, but that area called Amherst Center includes UMass. Um, and the whole campus. The ridership on PVTA is going is down. It's down um, to 4%. Um, they've, they've reduced some of their bus service. There's 2,000 more cars that, are, that pay excise tax in Amherst um, in 2019 and then 2009. And we know we have at least two or 3,000 more students here. Um, there are more cars and fewer bus drivers overall. I don't have the numbers of the PVTA use in Amherst. I couldn't pull that out of the... Um, document. And so 32% um, of commuters work outside of Amherst. There's not a lot of information about p individuals' car use, because I think this is a really hard place to live without a car. And most people I know um, who in families or couples have two cars at least. And so that's that would be really interesting to me about how many cars per person. You know, in Somerville, where I used to live, which is the most dense um, community city in North New England, there's one car for every like 1.156 of a person, which is sort of startling because it's very dense and has a lot of mass transit. We're not that well served by mass transit unless you're going to UMass or um, Hadley or Northampton when the schools are in session. And after that, it really drops down. And so I think that um, I would I want, I'm, I, I want to, I would love information on the waiver. like. These are not going to be undergraduate students that you're keeping out. They're going to be grad students. They're going to be adults. They're going to be people with jobs. Um, and I'm, I'm not, I need to be convinced that going to that amount of cars is going to use them. The other question I really have is, you know, if I had two people lower for the Super Bowl, that would kill the guest spaces in this thing. And so I think when you say that people have people over for the weekend, people have guests they visit, there's just not a lot of space here for people. And so you know, it, we've gone from 48 spaces down to 32. Some of those are handicapped spaces. And so it's really, it's, you know, it's really compressing the site. And what happens when people need a car? What's the management plan for that? And how does your management plan reduce the use of you're expecting from people? I still think taking, I'm sorry, I think taking away, saying, telling tenants you can't park doesn't reduce the need for parking, it just reduces the parking. So the management plan is supposed to reduce the need for parking and then provide, I mean, so when I look at management plans, I see, you know, carpools, van pools. In Somerville, there's like a guaranteed ride. So if you need a ride, you get a guaranteed ride. There's ways of helping people who need a car how to get there some other way. So that's... Well, that's, you know, part of, you know, a lot of the data that you can look up, um, that's what they're saying, you know, the millennial groups, age 16 to 34, because of Uber and Lyft and everything else, and the cost of owning a car, uh, they're just not doing it. They're not buying houses, and they're not buying cars. Um, that's a new generation, and I think that's where we're looking, you know, to provide housing for to a certain extent anyway. And it's not all, you know, I don't know what the mix is gonna be. I mean, that's our hope, you know, as far as tenants, but 
um, in a new management plan, I say well-qualified undergraduates. So it's, it's a way you manage a property to be straightforward about it. Um, and I've always been pretty tight on managing and towing cars if I need to. But I've never run into that problem, to be honest. You know, Super Bowl parties or whatever, you park on the street for that night, like anybody does. You know, if you had a party at your house, you don't have enough room in the driveway, that's where they park. And it's only for a few hours. But I got to look at, you know, from a management standpoint, the owner of the property, how am I going to enforce that? Is it going to be enough? And based on my experience with the two other properties in town since 1981, um, I think this is very doable and, and very controllable. Any other questions? Did you have your hand up there? Here, okay. Uh, Maria? So we keep saying we need a lot of data, a lot of data, and I don't think this project is the project to solve our just between what's in our zoning bylaw for parking and what this project is providing. I think we should look at this project through the lens of site plan review and what this owner has done with the space that um, they had available. They very respectfully scaled the project to the neighborhood. You can see from the site plan, they maybe can add one or more spaces, but then they'd lose the green space. So based on the space they had with the site, um, the number of actual beds is 35 beds, and there's 32 spaces. So again, right, some of those spaces are handicapped or electric charging spaces. So it's not <clears throat> too far off, and I really appreciate the data you collected. That was really mm -hmm. eye-opening, and I hope that was all captured in the minutes, because mm -hmm. I'd love to keep that data. Um, and so also hearing how you will be really respectfully managing this property as you do your other properties. I feel like we shouldn't be punitive to this project and this client, uh, this owner, this developer, this, because this project has done very well as far as being respectful of the site, um, maximizing the number of units that, you know, they think the market can handle or is, is asking for. And space in these high density areas near downtown is so valuable. To give that space to a car seems so backwards to me. But again, that's a bigger discussion. We, we should be looking at this project for itself, what it's providing, and based on what it is providing as far as the number of housing, the amount of uh, office space, and the parking, they're not, it's not like there's this huge reach of a you know, greedy sort of, I'm going to put 200 units and provide eight spaces. You know, it's pretty close. And I think to have the parking be the reason this project doesn't go forward is a real shame. Um, I think it's going to bring a lot to this area. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think it's a big ask. I don't think it's a big take that they're taking from the community by not reaching the two per unit parking requirement that's currently in our zoning bylaw. And I think we should just focus on this project and not about the bigger issues of what ifs, you know, what if this person has one car or two cars, or what if, you know, I think just looking at this project, it's done very well for the space it has and for giving a good balance between residents, office users, and parking. <coughs> so I guess I just I would I would hate to see this project go under because of a bigger discussion where we've been constantly having on many projects about parking count. So um, yeah, that's my two cents. Could I make one comment? Uh, well, two comments. You know, this if you look at the project you approved um, last July, the number of bedrooms is 16.6 percent more. So it's not all that much more as far as the bedroom count. Um, I forgot what the other point I was going to make. <laughs> It'll come to me. Doug? I just wanted to confirm, it's my understanding I am not voting on this because I was not part of the earlier hearing. I was going to bring that up next, that um, I was going to finish with the questions on this, but then remind everyone that if we are going to take a vote on this, that 
both the SP and the SPR need five votes to, um, for a supermajority of seven members of the planning board. We have one member that is sick today, and we have a new member, which I was going to introduce you at the end, but we have Doug here, and due to uh, the way it works, um, it has been decided um, that he is unable to vote today, so there's only, yes, so there's only five of us here, and we will we'll need a unanimous vote. So um, we need to come to some kind of um, agreement on the parking, uh, because that seems to be the issue. Uh, I just want to put, um, I, I'm know a lot about parking, probably too much. Um, but I just wanted to bring up one other element that hadn't come up that, you know, transportation is, is quickly evolving and preferences are changing. The data shows that. That's what these parking studies are showing, that the generations that are behind us are changing their driving habits. And um, a lot of that has to do with climate change. And Amherst is a place that really believes in sustainability and green issues. And this is one way maybe we can justify why we would OK a project like this. Um, today in the Gazette, Senator Hines had an editorial uh, about you know, the green initiatives that are being um, taken up uh, by Governor Baker. And there was just one stat. It said Massachusetts has 5 million cars and light trucks, and they contribute to 40% of our carbon emissions every day. So if nothing else, I know as a parking semi-professional that this ratio is OK. You build your parking for it to be 80 to 90%. You don't build it to be 30 or 40 and for event parking. That's not what you do. So you want to find that, that sweet spot. And do we know if this is the sweet spot? We do not. But I'm willing to take a risk, because this building is being built for more than a 30-year lifespan. And I know that five years from now, we will be 100% sure on this sweet spot. And as we have looked at the studies, the number is far below one. I mean, that, that 18 municipalities they looked at, the number ended up being closer to 0.55. So that's my two cents. David? Um, I'm, well, I'm sympathetic to the request for the re waiver of the parking requirements. The study that, that a number of people have cited and that you cited to Mr. Roblowski um, did tie sort of the reduced parking with also sort of an increased opportunity for affordable housing. And, and it seems that this is an opportunity here for to you know, one way to, um, I think, perhaps persuade, be more present a, a, a more persuasive case, perhaps for the reduced parking, is that according to the again the Metro Boston Perfect Fit Parking Initiative, providing affordable units reduces the demand for parking even more. In the according to the study, and intuitively that makes sense to me, um, and because of the location of it. This site seems like it's an opportunity. Would that be something that you would be willing to consider? Um, would, would yeah? Would that be something you'd be willing to consider? I'm not sure. I'm not really familiar. I've heard stories about if you do provide an affordable unit that the town manages it or something, and I guess it would be have have to be something I would look at or want more information on. Um, I'm, I'm really not familiar with dealing with that. I know I know how to deal with my properties mm -hmm. and sure. Uh, well, it does involve a process. Maybe Chris can elaborate on that. Um, what it entails, like the monitoring, yeah, support. So I think Mr. Reedy is probably a really good um, resource for this right now because he has a client who recently yeah. um, built a building on University Drive, and he included four affordable units there, and he's building another building on University Drive and including, I believe, five affordable Four. units. But in any event, <clears throat> it requires, um, it's, a, it's a fairly complicated process. You have to, unless you're very well schooled at it, you need to hire somebody to help you, hire somebody to um, do a lottery to choose tenants. Um, and then once the tenants are chosen, you have to sort of monitor their um, eligibility to remain where they are. 
um, and you have to, um, you know, do reporting, and um, you have to put your property um, under a deed restriction in order to um, make sure that those units are maintained as affordable. So, you know, there is there is some more to it than um, just charging lower rents. And maybe just to buttress that a little bit, and what Chris mentioned with the deed restriction, so there's a regulatory agreement that is required to be signed to qualify the unit or the units on what's called the subsidized housing inventory, which is monitored and managed by the Department of Housing and Community Development. One of the provisions of that regulatory agreement requires that if the property is ever transferred, the town and the DHCD effectively get to disqualify anybody that would want to buy the property mm -hmm. if it doesn't meet certain requirements. And so when we're talking about, you know, Mr. Robleski, and if there was a regulatory agreement associated with it, then if he were ever to, to sell it, um, to transfer it, he would have to first go to the town and say, here's who I'm transferring it to, what do you think? I can tell you just from some transactional experience, time is the friend of no deal, and then if somebody who is also not well versed in the subsidized housing inventory or what it entails, because there are costs associated with lottery, there are costs associated with the monitoring and maintenance, and then there's also a, a less rent. So for a one or for a one bedroom, let's say with a utility allowance, you're probably less than seven hundred dollars a month, and for. A, or, or maybe that's a studio, and for one bedroom, you're probably at $790 a month. For a two bedroom, you're probably at $1,000 a month, which is, if you know what market rate rents are here in Amherst, there's a few hundred dollar per month difference. And so that is borne entirely by the developer at that point. They have to construct it the same way that they do every other unit. Um, and so, but they're getting less rent for that unit or those units. But it's that. All of that aside, I think it's that regulatory agreement and that um, the additional hurdles to jump through for a transfer of the property uh, that, that can cause some concern, especially um, if someone were to come and look to buy it. You also, if you're going to get a mortgage, you have to get the, the bank to be on board with having this regulatory agreement as well. And so it's, while it is, I mean, good intentions and we understand, I think maybe Mr. Robleski will have to think about it offline a little bit. I mean, I don't know. Part of this is contextualizing where we are right now. And so he has an approved project with 30 beds. Mm -hmm. And he's coming back to ask for five more beds. And it, it feels like there's, and I, I, I agree with the planning board member, who says, well, let's look at what we're doing here with the infill development and, and what this is and the scope of it and, and understanding that there are larger issues in town. I mean. I think you know that I'm involved in a lot of the different projects and know of the parking, of the affordable, of all these issues. But I would agree that this isn't respectfully the project um, to have hung up for those things. I think there has to be a zoning bylaw change. I think the planning board understands that and they're going to get data and actually effectuate that. And I think that uh, that is both parking and with affordable units. I think there's a lot that should and, and can be changed. I think that there are waivers. You know, when there are folks that may say you're not working in accordance with the bylaw, and, and my response would be, no, this is exactly what the bylaw provides because it builds in that section 7.9 waiverability. <coughs> if, if you wanted it to be in accordance with the bylaw, you wouldn't provide an out through a waiver. You would require somebody to go through a variance, which is a very specific process under state law with a zoning board of appeals that requires soil, shape, or topography. <coughs> right. I mean, you get it if... Yeah. We won't have to talk about other towns that you can get it in, but um, I just I, I want to suggest that this is an appropriately designed site based upon the, the data that John has looked at, based upon personal experience, um, and I think based upon best practices. So I will, we'll look at the, the affordable pieces, a little bit of horse trading. Frankly, I don't know that I could recommend that he says, it's worth the five bedrooms to go through it because I can tell you that with Amherst Housing Authority, as far as marketing goes, you're talking about, you know, for the four units on <clears throat> University Drive was $25,000 just to go through the wow. market, the lottery to get to that point. And that's not the annual monitoring, it's not the maintenance, and it's not the difference between fair market and what you're getting. And so there, there's a lot. And I think as you're thinking about zoning changes, maybe I don't think developers mind doing it. 
um, if there's some incentive, if you get more market rate units and so that subsidy is kind of spread out a little bit more evenly instead of all affecting the developer, so. Well, but you are getting more units. You're requesting five more units. Five more beds. Five more beds. Right. You know, to talk about that a little bit in my years of dealing with people, I mean, I understand people. We're all people. And there's situations that have come up through the years where <clears throat> their rent is considerably lower because I recognize that they have family issues or whatever. They're trying to raise three kids or whatever. So, you know, in a way I'm dealing with subsidies. I'm taking money out of my pocket and my wife's pocket and my grandchildren's pocket, so to speak. But I understand people have different things going on in their life. We all do. And I, did, I guess I managed from the heart, not only from the pocketbook. Janet. So um, this issue for me is um, important because I think that if we go from the bylaw, which requires two parking spaces per unit, and then we're going down, you know, one space per bed or whatever. <coughs> I think we're starting using this waiver. The planning board is starting to amend the bylaw by waiver. And my question um, is, how do you meet the standards of this waiver? And it's not, to me, it's very specific. Um, it is important to me what it says. And I think the impact is, um, it, it does land on the tenants. It can land on the neighbors. Um, and so I'm not. You know, and you do have a project that came to us before, and I was, I was so, I really liked that project. The first one, I thought, well, there's enough parking, there's enough space, you know, it's, it's right size for the lot and everything like that. So I don't think we're going to kill that project if we say no to this project. And um, I just think that we can't, you know, every time we talk about the perfect fit report, which is based on the Boston metro area, I don't know why we're talking about it because we don't live in a city. Um, you know, that we don't live in a major mo metropolitan area. And I would be very interested in knowing what the parking needs are in Amherst. And that's what the transportation plan identifies specifically. You know, the downtown has been well studied. But even in, you know, we have a no parking district where there's one, people are looking, you know, in those two buildings, they're using more than one permit or parking permit or space per, per um, unit. And so, that isn't quite working, and so you know, I would recommend the planning board look at that and say, you know, we need to have enough parking for people in a building, and so I just think it, I think we need to do the studies before we do amend the bylaw, and I'm not willing to amend the bylaw by just waving and waving and waving on what we you know believe about millennials or what we think is going to be in there, you know, I just I don't I, I just don't have the data, and I would actually love to I'd love that you went out and did that because I sort of do that too. Okay, so at this point, um, let's just move on to some other issues that were left hanging at the last meeting. Um, I had a question about the landscaping. Um, at the last discussion, a member had brought up concern about the parking spots in front of the existing building, um, and we talked about how they were going to be the, the electric uh, charging station spots and why they had to be there because they're near the connection and all that. But there was talk about how, you know, it, um, you know, everybody doesn't think electric cars are beautiful but not that beautiful. So you talked about putting a bed and I saw that there were some plants, but um, I was still a little concerned <laughs> if they're, you know, 365 year round plants, or could it be a fatter bed? Could it tie into where the sign um, is? You know, actually create a larger bed with some actual bushes and um, greenery. So, what we've got um, on the screen is what we're proposing, but I think we can take a look at making it more robust so you this is the spot this is the spot that you're talking about right here uh, yes exactly do we see something before we there was nothing there before right there was nothing there before and so I it think. got brought up so the architect had had added she mentioned that during her talk oh, that she did put some 
Green, you're there. I'm just saying I, in my mind, had something a little bit more robust. I think it was Maria who brought up. She can, if you. Um, well, there's there's going to be some, tall, obviously those aren't to size, but there's going to be some taller shrubs around the transformer there in the back. So you're going to have the parking space barrier, so to speak, the sign, and some bigger bushes behind there also. I think it's um, shielding the cars from the roadway to so you don't yeah. notice the cars or the parking lot so much. Like a, it, you know, it's a bit of a raised bed around mm -hmm. the sign. If maybe you just had a little bit, like continued that Continue raised bed and come around and yeah. then yeah. just put some add some more robust something. Yeah, there stuff that's, that's sort of green. Uh, which sure. If you do, um, you know, some there. some of it to be more green or evergreeny or something yep. that you know okay. shields you know, year round because you know it's something. New England. So we can yeah we can look at that and whether it's like a, a spruce or something that's yeah, yeah. we can some low arbor, you know the, I'm not a, and if you had a landscape similar, architect similar planting system just in front of the transformer yeah, okay I agree the two things there absolutely connected, maybe not literally connected but visually connected would make us would make good sense I think. Can I ask a quick question? Can, can I be reminded why the transformer has to be there? Or is it just there That's already? That's where it connects. If you move them to behind the building, it's far away. You is it, is that more expensive? Or? Oh, oh, yeah. OK. And so I didn't realize that shrubs had been put in. I would recommend them high enough to screen the view to cover the car, because you know, when you go up Main Street, you basically see lawns and lawns and lawns. And so this would sort of jump out as cars looking like they're parked on the lawn. Yeah, four foot high shrubs or something. Yeah, high four, shrubs four would be foot great. Because if you remember, the, the topography rises. Yes. And if you put, a, even if it's a foot raised bed and then you have a four foot bush, I think you're lower on the street. So mm -hmm. you can see, I think yeah. even right. bushes That's would a make a big difference. We can come back with that. And how high is that transformer? <coughs> Boy. Uh, it's probably going to be similar to what uh, University Drive, so about six feet. Six feet high? Yeah, I've got a... Yeah. Electricity. But those bushes in front of the existing porch are mm -hmm. like seven and a half feet tall. And most, some of them are evergreen, as you see there. Think of the holly on the corner and the rhododendron. And then during the summertime, it's... Uh, burning bush or something that's in between there. The so as you're looking up uphill, plus the, where the transformer is going, we're lower in that section about a foot to a foot and a half. Okay, but that, that transformer's placement is between the rhododendrons in the street. Correct. Right? Yes. So you would need to plant something else. In front of the transformer. Front of the transformer. Right. Yes. Right. Which I do remember that being talked about. You talked about bushes well, five feet or something. Yeah, there's three bushes that we talked about. There's mm -hmm. Nahoki cypress that are currently yep. growing I remember there. That. And possibility one landscaper so we can transplant those over to there. Exactly. And those are like yeah. six and a half feet. That's what now. I remember from yeah. last time. Um, and there was talk, I'm looking up the driveway, and um, I do see some like arborvitaes or bushes as you go up the driveway on the right in front of the new building uh, further up. We had talked about thinking about a tree or something because there was some green space there. I don't know what. Well, that's, if you remember the, the comment that I said, we can't put much in the front between the railroad tracks to the right side of the driveway because that's where the stormwater underground tanks are. Right. So we can't have roots growing into the air. I think we were talking about uh, between where you're going to put that new rebuilt shed area and your front door of your existing. There was just like green space uh, right there. We're yeah, over in there here? was in that area. That, okay. You know, and the architect was going to look at that. I um, think propane is there well, is a propane tank yeah, buried. That's is, about the only spot right there where okay, the hand that's is a the good, propane tank is okay. going to be buried there. And the cover for the propane tank is going to stick up, I think, like six or eight inches. But it's 16 feet long. <coughs> Pretty. But I'm thinking, you know, maybe a, a sitting bench in that area. That would like be nice. That with a couple mm. of shrubs. That's what I have next door. I used some of the stone, in fact, from where we took a barn down that was dilapidated on the high street property. 
built stone walls in front of the house, use it for sitting benches, use it yeah. for, you know, landscape, highlights, the stones that came from the site. Sounds nice. And if you could remind me of how many bike spots you had um, on the outside and in the... Well, that uh, bike rack area yeah. um, is going to be like 14 feet long. Okay. So it's basically attached to the what you see now that's there. It's 14 by 14. Mm -hmm. And then we're just adding that little area to the left for uh, more trash and recycling. Um, I think there's like 14. You can put like 14 or 15 okay. bikes, you know, with a loop style. Mm -hmm. Plus Sounds what's good. inside in the back of the trash building there. Probably another, you could probably put 15, 20 15. bikes there. Okay, great. Yeah. Wonderful. It's a good place to bike. And the other point I thought of to, <laughs> to answer a question is, you know, it says seven office spaces in the existing building. Now keep in mind, one of them is the section that we're going to rebuild. Okay, so that's one office. So right. now we end up with six. Now, the way it's been run over the years when we bought it is it's six individual rooms, basically. And they share a conference room and a waiting room. So what I'm envisioning is to separate that into three office offices, to like two room offices within that existing building. Okay. So that's gonna be you know less traffic. And yeah. I think the upstairs would probably be like therapists, something like that, to have people come in for an hour or something and leave. And downstairs, maybe some small office, accountants, lawyers, you know, some service, something like that. Whatever's allowed under, yeah, he won't move there. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever's allowed under the bylaw, anyway, in the BN zone. So it's not going to be seven offices, so to speak. It'll be like three office suites, plus the new office and a new building. Good to know. Thank you. Any other questions from the board um, regarding other issues that we talked about the last time? Madam uh, Chair, just one thing, yeah. architect just wants to clarify oh, something about sure. the um, planting in front of the parking. Christine Royal again. I just wanna say that we try to go very lightly in the renderings with how the vegetation looks so that we're not you know, obscuring the way that the architecture looks. But the, what we've called out in the landscape plan is three inkberry bushes in front of the parking, the south side of the parking at the front that we were just discussing. Inkberry is an evergreen and it's a shrub that matures at five to eight feet. So it's a little misleading the way it's rendered, but we didn't <clears throat> want to hide the parking because we, we all know sense. it's there. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned the <coughs> propane tank. That was one of the items that um, was hanging from the last time where it was going to be put. I see we have <coughs> a fire department says it's fine. Um, maybe you can just point. It was in that, yeah, right. Okay, great. Yeah, we ran into an issue. I was hoping to put it on the back of the building, but um, the setback for placing the propane tank, it has to be 10 feet from a building mm -hmm. and 10 feet from an adjoining property line. So with the 20 feet setback and behind the building, there's your 20 feet, so you can't put the tank anywhere. I thought about the reason the fire department sent that last comment um, prior to this one I was thinking about maybe putting it on my adjoining property and giving an easement Can for you? that too. But, oh. um, it, is that complicated? Not going to work. Oh. Yeah. But this fits all our requirements, and again, it's just that little cover that sticks up and mm -hmm. landscape around it. I think it'll fit. Sounds good. Um, so at this point, uh, we, Chris, could we do the special permit? Um, would the board feel comfortable with moving ahead on the special permit? Um, we could make a motion and um, first I, I'll just open it up if, that, if that's a go out. I still have to do public comment to see if anyone would want to speak on the special permit. Um, May I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. And this is really a question for Mr. Reedy or Mr. Robleski. Um, if the special permit were approved but the rest of the plan were not approved, would they still go ahead with the um, um, new building that is allowed by the special permit. Would that fit into the old plan? I 
want to do it first and do it all together. Well, right, right. But would you still need this piece of it? I have a question before would I get you still the motion. Take that down. Okay. Put that up. Yeah, if you want to get this building, if you got the building that was previously approved. After they get their answer. No. After they know a critical. Oh, we had the previous one? <laughs> it's I, to serve the residents, yeah. yeah. I, I, think it, I think it makes sense to go forward to give Ms. Robuski, the option of if this, you know, I think we'll hear some conversation later about where this next one is going, but I think to have that um, be able to come down, I think whether it's with this new proposed based upon what we hear or some revision thereof or the original, I think this is going to come down either way. And we also, the Historical Commission has been out there and, and I've had the meeting with them and they are okay with, you know, rebuilding that section. Michael, do you have a... Uh, yeah, I, I, I want to ask, go back to a, um, something, a statement you made a moment ago about uh, Mr. Marshall not being able to vote. Uh, it seems to me when we last took this up, it was SPR 2020-01, uh, and this is SPR 2020-05. Seems like this is a different SPR. And so this is the only hearing we've had on this SPR, and, and I think you should be able to vote on this because it's the only one we've had on this. We actually, this is continued from January 15th. Sorry. The special permit is new, sorry. but I don't believe good, good I stand, I stand good corrected. Good I'm sorry. Good Chris. So I think Mr. Marshall would be able to vote on the special permit application, but mm -hmm. not on the site plan review, which you've already had um, a hearing on. That's my opinion. And that would, of course, be his decision. No pressure as a first day on the planning board. Um, are there any other questions or issues either on the special permit or on how we proceed tonight. Well, then I, I'd propose a motion for, on the special permit, and just the special permit. Um, we could do that. I just have to check with public comment. Oh, which, yes. If, if we're going to move forward yep. on this. Uh, is there anyone here to speak on the special permit part of this public hearing on 462 Main Street? I see no hands. Um, so, Chris, do we have to go over anything or can we just have a motion for the special permit? Yeah. You'd have to make a finding that it is not um, substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood okay. to allow this to occur. Can that be in the motion? And that can be in the motion. So we would close the public hearing for the part of the special permit and, um, ex and accept that finding, and then you can make a motion if you so wish. Okay. <laughs> so I'll move that, that we consider this application for a special permit and that the, it's not substantially det more detrimental to the neighborhood or the appropriate language, but that was the gist of it, um, to permit the special permit going forward. Is there any more discussion, questions, comments at this time? I see none, so uh, we'll take a vote. All in favor of the special permit? I see unanimous. Okay. Thank you. Thank so, you. That's good. Um, is there anything outstanding on this right now? Like, I, I, I mean, only that, do we have a land, so we don't have a current landscape plan. You, you do have a current landscape plan. Oh. It sounds like it may one? need to be updated. Um, and also what I'm hearing is I'm not sure that I have the votes on parking. So, I mean, I let us, I guess we would request a continuation to the March 4th hearing and let us think about um, either providing more data and trying to convince some folks that there's enough um, or considering the affordable piece or looking to add more parking and seeing where that leads us, you know, if there's a, a way to do it. I, I don't know that there is and we may come back and say this is what it is. 
frankly, take it or leave it, or, or that's it. And I, I mean, I, you, I don't like to give ultimatums. Um, but that might just be what it turns out to be. But at least let us go back and investigate. And if, if we can come back and make it work for everybody, then great. And if not, then I think we're going to have to have a conversation. Okay. That sounds like a good option. Um, I would also love if you could submit the data you collected on the parking, um, even if it's a photocopy of the data you took or something, and then um, the we can planning probably, department we can, could organize mm -hmm, yeah, we'll it. We'll put or it into something. an Excel spreadsheet, and then because okay. I think it's useful, just I think generally for everybody <coughs> in the room to have it. And, and when, when, so, could oh. you just know the time and the place when you did that? Smart. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also, uh, if it could be per bedroom. Because sure. you, oh, you, it, you emphasize, when you're do, going through it, you emphasize the empty spaces. And that's less important than how many bedrooms and how many cars. Mm -hmm. And he can probably fill some of that out. Janet, I recommend. So um, I'm just also going to offer the idea of sort of overflow parking, maybe with the VFW across the street. Um, I know that involves a special permit, but if that was the commitment and you thought that that could work out by talking to them informally, um, just yep. we'll consider. Well, would you I mean and maybe spot. some other business because there's a lot of businesses along there that probably have empty parking at well, what night about me it, using my park and then I have excess parking next door it, so that I was just going to add you could look at that um, again I, and um, you also mentioned uh, possible because you're an experienced landlord you obviously care you want to run a good business that's obvious mm -hmm and you don't want to cause a problem. And if there was a problem that evolved in your parking situation, you would find ways to oh, alleviate that or fix it. it. Right. I read in your plan that you say that you would, you know, if it came to that, you would offer rent discounts to people who only had one car or no car. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that could also, you could look at that a little harder and actually have that as a starter mm -hmm. for some of your sites. I, I'm just but, saying, just, you know, to consider. Um, and maybe you will have some of your apartments that, a few of them that don't have parking or only have one or what I'm just saying, you know, look a little harder. There's been some other developments around that we're, it's this trying to find that sweet spot. Mm -hmm. um, I see Michael. I think it's just um, another thing you might think about, um, you quoted the master plan, which I appreciate. Um, one of the principles of the master plan relative to affordable housing is that incentives be found, that the, the, the planning board, the town council, we find incentives to create uh, affordable housing. Possibly the, the going way down on the parking requirement is an incentive. And if it were thought about in that way, and if you came up with one or two affordable units, that might be convincing uh, to the board. Might be to me, anyway. At uh, Janet? So just just going up the street, like the Red Barn, the Amtrak station, there's a lot of you know businesses that at night that parking lot is almost empty. So there's spaces, and you know the transportation plan talks about shared parking. Um, I know it's a little tricky getting a special permit, but that might be something we should look at on the zoning subcommittee about loosening those requirements so they're a little easier for people to do. Shared parking can be a good thing. Um, any other? suggestions for them to look at, Chris? I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows that, um, as Janet said, Ms. McGowan said, um, it is a requirement to um, change the permit for the property to which the parking goes. Mm. So if it were to go to Mr. Roberleski's property on High Street, he would have to change his, prop his yeah. permit for that property. If it were to go to the you know, um, area near the train station, that permit would have to change. So there are kind of you know, cascading consequences for that type of uh, arrangement. Right. Thank you for reminding us of that. Um, so if we continue this SPR, uh, the 19th looks bananas um, for us. So it would be the next meeting. There's some space. Uh, would that be agreeable to you? I think, <coughs> is that, oh, good Lord, is that March 4th? 4th? Wow. Okay. Might be. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what else? I don't remember what we have on the fourth. I know Mr. Mora's coming. Yes, Chris. 
So what I remember that you have on the fourth is um, Rob Mora is coming. We've changed, we're changing him from the um, 19th of February because it's too too overloaded. Um, and also you have um, Jeff and Jack Brown coming about a driveway on Bay Road. And um, I think Buck. Oh, that and that's Bucky Sparkle. That's right. And I think that's uh, it so far. Bucky Sparkle is an engineer. Yeah. He's been here before. And depending on what happens with Amherst Hills, how much we can get done between now and the 19th, perhaps that one will go on the 4th as well. I'm not sure. But anyway, we know we're having Rob Mora yeah. and the Browns to come about their driveway. So is there a time? Could we set them first at that point? Great. It's 7.05 Seven. on March 4th. We'll continue this hearing till then. Madam Chair, do we want to have any public comment on the SPR All right. just in that, case there's any additional? That's a good point. Um, is anyone here to speak on the SPR? Ah, oh, great. Come on up. They'll make room for you. No, no, that's, we want you to come up, sit down, and um, Tom, her, her mic's on. Is that? See, you're like the flicker and the, yeah, thank you. I, and just say your, state your name and, and your street address for the well, minute taker. Formal. And welcome. Um, hi, I'm Katie Wright. My husband and I own 513 and 531 Main Street across the street, so we've just had an interest in this um, development. Um, and certainly, you know, we have an eye on parking, but I think um, even more important than parking is just congestion in general. I know the, the idea is infill of available land at, Area in the you know in the center of Amherst, but um, we already uh, mentioned that a lot of times, especially certain times of the year, the PBTA is overloaded and people are you know missing classes and and late to work and things because the bus service is not available. Um, the school, if you've ever tried to actually drive anywhere near the high school in the morning, it's kind of a nightmare, and you know, um, so this that might be a bigger consideration. But um, is it feasible to contact the PBTA and ask them to add another bus to that group? Anyone can always do that. <laughs> That's a um, great idea. Yeah, and the I mean, truth is they do track the numbers yeah. um, very closely. And right. demand means the more usage they need right. to but, I mean, it's been that way for years. I've lived there for 20 years. The other years. problem is they it's balance nice. money, of course. Right. So, right. Um, yeah, so. But no. Everyone, right, right, you know, and right, right to your um, the politicians and your right. uh, your local representatives and all that, because the more voices, the more right. buses. Right. So that would just. Well, in my conversation with Alex Forrest, they are aware of this particular route mm -hmm. in particular mm -hmm. yeah. starts at Old Belchertown Road out by the old landfill, yeah. gets you know Gatehouse Road, Colonial Village, Is it Lower 30 Main or Street. 31? Is it, we all yeah. know them by yeah, numbers. Yeah, 31, and then no, I think is it, 30. Is it 30? And then I there's like a 34. 30. There's two that go down. Okay. But, anyway. but you know, even, you know, like that time my tenant couldn't get on a bus, you know, it goes up and stops here at Churchill Street and picks up additional people, goes through the center of town, then to UMass, and stops mm -hmm. it through UMass and Pupton Village. But he is aware of that route is overloaded, and he's going to... They're working on, you know, adding the tandem buses or something like that right, right. to get more Bigger. capacity. So they are very aware of it, and they want to work on that. So it is an active great. work in progress, so to speak. At uh, rush hour, how many? Yes. How often does a bus stop there at rush hour? Fifteen minutes. Thirty is pretty and frequent. That, that data I mentioned, the 202 people I got on on Wednesdays in September of 19, 60 percent of them were before noontime and 50% of that was before 10 a.m. So they're going to try to, you know, overload the route, so to speak, and get more capacity to accommodate everybody to get them to UMass or wherever they're going. So they are working on it. Good. Okay. And put those calls and emails in. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you for Would you mind out. stating your last name again? Thank you. Thanks. All right. So at this point, we'll, uh, I do I need a motion to continue the, so somebody? Yeah, move to continue did. the meeting till March 5th at, 4th? March 4th at 705. <laughs> second that someone? Anyone? Second. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, any discussion? No, all in favor? 
Unanimous. Great. Great. All right. All yes. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank we'll you very see much you for on your the time. Fourth. Okay. Um, I would like to take a little break, if that's all right for everyone. A five minute break. Just to... so we are going to continue. Uh, we will move to item four master plan update. This actually ties in a lot to the uh, planning and zoning item five, the zoning subcommittee report. Um, Chris, maybe it's appropriate if you start and then maybe Maria, you can give a little summary of what happened at the zoning subcommittee and reference documents that we have. Um, start by saying that you all have two packets. You received one packet in the mail, and then you received another packet on your desk. And most of what you received on your desk has to do with the master plan update. And the agenda says revised February 3rd. And um, we revised it because we dropped an item. So I can go through the packet and tell you what's in here, and then we can start to discuss it. Um, so I guess the first two pages don't have to do with uh, master plan, but the, um, there is a memo from uh, Janet McGowan about a conversation that she and I had with someone from Pioneer Valley, no, excuse me, M Metropolitan Boston um, Planning Commission, MAPC, on um, master plan process. There's a memo from Michael Burt Whistle um, in response to the CRC memo, and uh, it talks about the difference between the words approve and adopt, and then makes some conclusions at the end. There's a memo um, also from Michael Burt Whistle uh, on the master plan process in which he sort of whittles down the process that was described in the CRC memo. Um, there is a memo from, well, it's the same memo from Michael Burt Whistle, but it has read um, highlights from Janet McGowan, who um, made responses to Michael's comments. Then there's um, a document that is, um, it looks a little bit like a, a <laughs> diagram for a computer, how a computer works. But anyway. Because it kind um, of is. Yes. It's, um, instead of CPU, it's got MPU. <laughs> but um, anyway, it describes um, how um, our website could work to um, improve the communication um, with the planning board and others and planning staff um, during the master plan update process. And that's what this is all about. This is about updating the master plan. I didn't give a good introduction, but we've been talking about updating the master plan. The uh, Community Resources Committee has proposed a process for updating the master plan, and now the planning board is trying to refine that process and uh, come up with something that will really work for the planning board. Um, there is a document in here from, um, that was drafted by Christine Gray Mullen. Uh, at the top it says draft 2010 master plan update process. So this has been through a couple of iterations and last night at the zoning subcommittee um, decisions were made about how the process might work better and Ms. Gray Mullen adapted that um, document based on what she heard last night. Yeah. Um, there is a schedule. Um, if you look, there's an Excel spreadsheet in here um, that mm -hmm. makes a proposition about um, how the planning board can manage all of the things that it's working on. So the planning board is working on master plan updates, um, flood insurance maps, zoning bylaw rewrite. They're going to have something to say about the 132 Northampton Road, probably at two different points during the next six months, um, reviewing South University Drive, uh, probably reviewing a, an application from Amherst Media, um, Kendrick Park Playground, and a, a number of other things. So it, this is really an attempt to get a handle on how all these things can be balanced without, you know, feeling really overwhelmed. And then there's, um, I think the last thing in the uh, packet is a chart prepared by Maria Chow, and that chart um, seeks to make it more simple uh, to describe how this master plan process will work. So I think it would probably be a good idea if 
each person described um, his or her own document, and then um, we could have a discussion about it. So I don't know, Ms. Graymullen, uh, where would you like to start? Do you want to start with? I think Maria's flow chart is probably just the easiest way to get everyone on the page mm -hmm. of just what's going to happen because we've heard we heard from CRC um, and how they're trying to get their memo and flow chart together. Um, so we're somewhat familiar with that. You right. mean we heard from CRC based on the memo we got? Yeah, uh, back six right. weeks ago. But this, if yeah. well, Maria will get it. But a lot of that, oh, you know. We don't get into their details, but it is mentioned on this flowchart. I just want to make sure we hadn't had another communication <laughs> from them. <laughs> may, I, uh, oh, yes. may I state that I have not seen the CRC memo, so whenever you are talking oh. about that, I am ignorant of that document. It has had a few revisions, and I do think this week a uh, new like final draft um, memo is coming out along with uh, a flow chart which they have not had to this point so you'll get it fresh uh, hopefully tomorrow but we can also send you the previous one but don't study that one as hard okay Maria sure so I can run through this flow chart and again this was sort of born from the feedback we were getting about the confusion and frustration with you know the process that was presented from CRC and then we don't have a process let's make a process and so last night I'm just going to combine this with the zoning subcommittee report real quick. And that all I'm going to say about that is that it was a really great meeting. We had a lot of differing opinions, different perspectives, and we ended up with a really great end result, I think, that could only come from that dynamic. And um, I really like that aspect of the zoning subcommittee meetings where it really feels more like a work session. And um, if we can bring more of that to the planning board, uh, during this master plan update process, that would be really fantastic. So, um, anyway, so this flow chart basically starts. <clears throat> the idea is that I'm trying to show what we have to do and what we have to do based on town charter so that it's not that these things are pulled out of the air. We actually, um, <clears throat> so starting January 15th, planning board agreed to the master plan update. And then the next step, we think, is really just having um, Chris talk to the planning staff, the town staff, the various people, or just taking a chapter and just going for it and taking a first stab at it. And this yellow arrow is sort of the part that Christine Gray Mullen will go through in her memo about the back and forth, the working section, sessions, the actual meat of the work, the, the place where all of the great stuff's going to happen. Um, so assuming that goes back and forth, back and forth, finally, we get to the planning department just compiles all of the, the nine months worth of work into a draft. It goes to the planning board and we vote to approve the final draft of this master plan update. And if it's a yes, you can see where it goes. If it's a no, we go back to just working on it some more. And ideally the nine months incorporates that sort of cyclical sort of um, work. Um, so say it's yes, uh, we go, we present it to the CRC and at this point they have 45 days and they're getting feedback from town council and the hope is that this is definitely not the first time town council has seen it. They've seen it when we were in that sort of yellow zone where we go back and forth. Um, we also have had a lot of public comment in that yellow zone so it's, it's ideally what the, this green blue path is, is almost administrative um, after the CRC, such that we should not be going back and forth um, in, through many iterations at this point once the CRC has it. That's what the hope of this process is gonna bring. Um, after the CRC has it, we, the planning board, review the feedback, and we work with, again, with the planning department on the actual revisions. And then, if it all looks good, the planning board votes to approve, and by mass state law, the planning board approves this master plan update. It is our master plan. And um, Christine will go into this idea of this MPIC that was part of the original master plan, the 2010 master plan, uh, <clears throat> that mentions this committee that should have been formed but never was. And last night we had a great discussion about various types of subcommittees, and this one sounded like the perfect fit, especially after this whole update process. And so this last bar at the bottom is based on how the town charter was written. And um, so the town manager gets this master plan update. Uh, town council, per the charter, has to hold a public hearing. And um, 
and then they'll vote to adopt the master plan. And the idea here is also that this public hearing is not the first and only opportunity that the public can give comment. Then that sort of earlier yellow area that Christine will go through, there's so many opportunities for the public to have their voices heard. This, this public hearing is just sort of, because of the way the challenge charter was written, it, it's just there. So, um, so that's the gist of this flow chart. It's just trying to show we don't want to make this a round and round iterative process. We want to make sure we get a lot of good work, a lot of good input from all the right people early on so that by the time it goes to CRC and town council, it's almost just sort of moving through a series of steps. So um, yeah, that's basically the flow chart. Thank you for that overview. Um, I just want to say if we pull up the memo, I know some of you have seen uh, uh, what was yesterday. A uh, few things are different. I just moved a few paragraphs around and uh, what we came out of uh, zoning subcommittee sort of simplifying the process that has all been implemented in this uh, to the memo, the memo uh, for the proposed process. Um, I won't get into really the first page. That's more of just about how um, how an uh, MPIC master plan implementation committee, uh, well, it doesn't exist right now, and that was part of the master plan when you update it, so we're still gonna update it, but part of the key is, and this was talked about a lot yesterday, is um, different words float around, but keeping this as simple as possible, um, um, doing a, a, you know, um, an update light uh, and part of this is if you go to page two, um, and there's a list reasons for keeping the update simple and limiting to necessary and obvious. Um, those are a bunch of reasons why we're doing this, and it's everything from this is our first attempt. Um, you know, 2010 was the first master plan that Amherst um, created, and this will be their first update attempt. Um, and then, you know, it's about time and workload and resources. Um, yet it needs to be done because it is part of our charge and uh, you know town council and other committees are eager for it because so much is sort of based off off the master plan but the thing to remember is the basic blueprint or um, framework of the master plan is not going to change so we talk a lot about wanting to keep CRC and town council updated but really even more ahead of them is we want as much public input and ways for the public to give feedback in this process, even if it is a, a simple or light update. Um, you know, a lot of people will be bringing up comments or have concerns about more complex issues that won't be addressed now, but all this will be collected uh, very formally and it will be presented to the uh, master plan um, implementation committee, I'll call it the MPIC, uh, it will be helpful for them. It will be helpful for the next update if there's another update in five years. Um, and it will be helpful for the creation of the 2030 master plan effort that could start, I mean, it could be six years now, but maybe it will be determined not to do another update and instead go right for start working on the master plan. But either way, we will have this group um, that will be collecting data. So. Um, if we just go to the uh, page, if we go to page four, I'm like trying to save us time here. I just want to point out what I created is planning goal. I said planning board has set goals on completing this um, MPU, master plan update. And, um, you know, this is what I came up with. I hope you agree. Um, you know, uh, this is a lot to digest and you all have homework. So when we come back, you know, if there's, um, you know, a goal that I forgot or we want to add to these. Um, but this is what I'm hoping will keep us focused. I want this to be a win for the planning board. Um, this is kind of our baby and it's our opportunity to shine and goodness knows sometimes we need some good publicity. Um, so as I wrote this, I was listening to all of the comments and the memos that were sent. I listened to town staff um, and I'm really, I'm striving for balance. I'm, that it's doable. I don't want to overstretch us, and I don't want to bite off too much, and yet I don't want to 
not have it uh, quality work. So, um, you know, take note of those goals and, and think about them. Um, so if you just flip back to page three briefly, uh, the, like, where there's a list towards the bottom of the page, public outreach and participation is a required and vital part of this MPU. This will be addressed in numerous ways. And I mention a website and then, of course, all the updates and committee, other committees and public feedback and <coughs> potential meetings and forums and all that good stuff, which then takes you to my highly professional little scribble here about our proposed website. Um, I did talk to um, the IT uh, marketing um, coordinator, director, uh, Brianna, um, whether this was possible, and she said it was. This is, uh, we can develop a beta and get this up and running. She says it's pretty simple. We just have to define our database fields. Um, I can bring that here, or maybe is a working group, the zoning subcommittee could just play with the beta to, um, and help define the database fields, because I do think if, we, if this works, this will be very helpful for our future zoning um, bylaw changes um, and kind of doing the same process. We can you know, use it on this and, and tweak it um, to use it in the future. Um, and then the last thing, I'm trying to talk fast here, is the uh, uh, evolving schedule. So this has gone through a few changes because, of course, as Chris Bestrup can tell us, you know, give it 10 minutes and, and this probably changes again. But um, what I was trying to show is building in the top line where sections, uh, section or two, uh, or sometimes I see it as a new section and maybe one that's already, you know, gotten comments from us coming back again. Um, just in the next six months, uh, different um, dates that we could sort of make that there's like a solid like hour that we talk about and review this. Um, and I think as it evolves, you know, this is not a, it's a fluid system, it's a guideline and you know, I think we'll learn a lot as we sort of work through the process. Um, but it also, I thought this would be helpful just adding the other projects and I'm gonna try to keep keep this fairly updated because um, it just gives us perspective on what we're working on and, and things that are coming up and, and all that. Um, so at this point I'll just ask, does anyone um, have, I think if you read the memo and look at the flow chart, um, you know, it will make a lot of sense, but of course if there's questions, you know, make a note of it and we'll talk about it at the next time, probably not on the 19th, but um, the 4th. Uh, can I go with Chris sure. first? Chris and then Michael. I just wanted to note that um, this chart really just includes the more high profile, yeah. larger projects that the planning board is gonna be working on. Of course the planning board will continue to work on yeah. all the smaller applications that you have, but I don't see any reason to have these on the schedule. I was trying, the one hit wonders, I was more trying to focus on things that are especially sometimes go to two or more meetings or take a significant part of one night. Yeah, but if you want to add to it, you can. <laughs> um, Michael. Uh, first of all, I think this is really excellent work, all this stuff. Um, thank you, Christine and, and Maria. Um, a, a week or so ago, uh, Christine Brestrup asked us to, to uh, suggest dates when we might not be available over the summer. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I think if those were on this chart, uh, that would be helpful, might be helpful to you guys in planning. Hugely. Things. Yes, so I'll reiterate it again, especially for Doug. As you're sort of evaluating, um, you ha we have a list, it, it, they're sort of on here too. I, um, we have a list of all the planning board dates. As you're determining your summer vacation, if you're gonna be away. Um, I, I just wanna ask Chris something. We've never done this, but can't people call in? We've never so, done it, but. No, as long as we have a quorum, here, people can call in and participate. Yeah, and various boards and committees are figuring out how to do that. Yeah. So it can be by Skype, it can be by phone, it can be by various mechanisms. Because I would be willing if you all, I thought the master plan is one of those issues that we could kind of try that on. I think with um, SPRs and special permits, it would be a little bit harder. Yeah, um, but something like this. The other part I was gonna say is if people are away, they can still get the section and do write-up and make their 
corrections, uh, feedback, or whatever, and send it in to us. So, because um, it's just last summer, a lot of um, people's vacations didn't overlap, so we missed a lot of meetings, and it made um, a, a pretty intense fall. So, um, we're trying to avoid that a little bit this year. So if people know when they're gonna go away this summer or even are sort of like thinking, um, send it to Chris and then we'll try to update it on this. And then if you're a maybe, by seeing this, maybe it will make you be like, oh, I could slide it that week or whatever. Or I also plead if you could try to avoid, you know, planning board meetings if you can. But yeah, great idea. And Chris, how would we go about finding out like doing a test drive, like, for someone calling in and trying to do something. I'm do you happy to stay at home. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. okay. I mean, if that's what you're asking. <laughs> or we could, no, <laughs> yeah, but we too. could get someone to call in. I was thinking, have you, but, like, have someone call in and, like, pretend to be, and we could don't, just. Don't eat while you're on the we wouldn't do this test during a real planning board meeting, but do you know any committees who are actually doing this? I have seen, I have heard of, committees and boards doing it. I just am not sure which ones, so I can explore that and okay, find out about thank it. thank you. And it requires um, a person who's... Okay, so maybe you can talk to them yeah. upstairs. Or and something. people have to ask permission from the um, chair, or tell the chair that they're gonna do this and sort of get permission from the chair to, to go ahead with it, so. Okay, good, we'll pursue that. Um, any other? questions or issues right now? So I think uh, if, if one of the seven or of us aren't here for a master plan discussion, I don't think that will be uh, problematic, particularly if we have a chance to comment in writing uh, before or, or even after, because even after we discuss it here, it'll still be open for public comment or, or questions through the website. Absolutely, I agree. I mean, part of it last summer was even getting a quorum. That's sure. where we couldn't get the four. Um, so that's a good idea. We'll start. So, so okay. Yes. So you're hoping we stagger rather than we all take the same week off and don't meet? We would rather have, well, it depends. That's what we have to see. In some ways, if it's only like one or two meetings, it's better to stack everybody the same and miss it. Um, the worst is when everybody ends up and it's too many. That's what happened and we couldn't hit the four. So. It's sort of a balancing act. So we'll, we'll see what people have planned. I know there's at least one member who does take um, some time off uh, to go is somewhere else, sorry. <laughs> so um, anyways, we'll just see how bad it is. Hopefully, you know, maybe it's not as bad this year. But we also want the master plan update to keep, you know, moving forward through the summer. <sighs> Janet. So do you want Michael to talk about his memo next or? If he wants to, sure. Uh, I don't have a lot to say. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't have a lot to say about it. Uh, I wrote it uh, three weeks ago, or yeah. perhaps two weeks ago, and it's sort of gone past things at this point. But basically, it was in response. I can't even find it now. It was in response to the. the uh, Thank you. There's one of them. <laughs> it was in it was in response to this uh, uh, the CRC's. Uh, letter of, of uh, how they wanted to work things, and I thought that was too complicated. And I tried to propose something that was less complicated and would do the job uh, because less complicated, better. Uh, and that was, that was this memo. And then uh, uh, it, it basically called for, uh, the, uh, for us, the planning board, to appoint a subcommittee, uh, which we are able to do. Given I looked at check the, our, our bylaw, our uh, um, rules and regulations, we can appoint committees. Uh, and it's not list. They don't have to be just members of the planning board. They can be anybody, apparently, because it doesn't specify that they have to be members of the planning board. In, in, in any event, we would have a subcommittee of the planning board charged with uh, implement with um, implementing this revision, this late revision of the master plan, um, and then um, work with it, work with staff, essentially the same way that the flow chart that we were just talking about does. Uh, but then, after working with the, with the um, um, with staff, then bring it as, as a full thing to the planning board. Uh, keeping the planning board in the loop, the, pretty much the way the planning board in this iteration tries to keep the CRC and the council in the loop. Um, 
I, I think now that we're talking about the planning, having um, Ms. Brester bring um, revisions directly to the planning board for discussions on this uh, nine month chart that we've been looking at, uh, I, I think that's a much more satisfactory and simpler, although it may be complex in terms of the individual comments around the board um, on those days. But I think that'll be a simpler way to do it, uh, particularly if we can, as Maria said a minute ago, uh, treat these sessions more like working sessions and less like formal presentations. Um, the microphone thing is difficult. Um, and if we could figure out a way to have all the microphones on at the same time, that might be helpful. Uh, yeah, but I don't want you all talking. I, that's the, the problem, Christine. I know you don't. And uh, that's so I'm suggesting that we do that. Um, in any event, I think if we can have, the, if we can have a, 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 a cordial and a busy working session around the table with people uh, in the audience, because this, that's one of the things we want to have, is, is have um, um, feedback in that, of that kind and input, not feedback, just but input. Uh, and I think that will be a much more satisfactory process than the one I ori had originally proposed. So um, having said that, I kind of basically withdraw my original proposal. Thank you. Um, Janet, I assume you want to talk about your memo? So, um, you know, after the meeting, like at the zoning subcommittee meeting, we were really digging into some stuff. And so I was very, um, I felt really strongly the zoning subcommittee wasn't the place for the master plan, planning kind of update to take place and that we should just focus on zoning, which is complicated enough and we have a lot on our plate. I really like the idea of the starting the master plan implementation committee because you're right that when you look at the implementation chapter, you know, that's the first thing they say you should do. And then when you look at the, like, you know, we the town has done a lot of the implement, implementing, but a lot of really important things didn't get done, or it makes sense you need a committee to kind of really focus on that. And so I was very psyched about that. Um, for me, the big issue is like, what's the depth of the master plan update? And so um, if it's a master plan light, I think that this proposal um, of, you know, just working with the planning department and the planning board makes sense. If it's gonna go deeper um, and without revising it and doing a whole new one, um, that was the phone call with Ralph Wilmer of the MAPC. And so I don't know if people wanna just sit and read, you know, skip everything in the beginning of this memo and just read the update steps, which is really like a page, a page of stuff. But the idea was to set up a steering committee of three planning board members like Michael suggested. I thought we should, everybody should grab three chapters they have a background in work with the planning department on that and the public and you know people from the TAC and all the different boards, you know, be in charge of that and then come to the planning board with some chapters as they're done. Um, so if you could just read that, what Rob, um, Ralph Wilmer suggested, I'll just be quiet for a minute. But clarification, you're suggesting that that's for the deeper dive. Yeah, I think it's good to look at. Because yeah. I think we, even if you're doing master pen light, we might start Trading, or we might get deeper than we hope, but it's just, I just think it's worth looking at. So, so I'm, I'm completely fine if we're going to do a light, not doing the steering committee. Um, if we're going to do a more thorough update, which could have benefits, um, I think we should, I would follow the Wilmer route. And so that would be my suggestion. So, but I really, I also really think 
the priority for me would be forming the master plan implementation committee and just, you know, pulling us together. Otherwise, my fear is that we'll have this 20-year master plan that we really haven't updated and we didn't really ever dig in and implement it in a more coherent way. And as we implement it, you know, you'll start seeing what has to be changed and what's working, what's not, and having some you know, assessments and things like that, so. Michael. Um, Janet, you, you, uh, I'm in agreement with the importance of the, of the Master Plan Implementation Committee. Uh, on, the, on Maria's flow chart, uh, you see that, that the, down toward the bottom, uh, it says formation of master plan and impl implementation committee. Um, and when I saw that, um, that was new from the chart that we saw yesterday. That wasn't on the, yesterday's chart. Um, my, my, and I think it's important that we have that. And at some point, we do that. And I'm wondering whether or not, uh, and this is really a wonder and not a, a, a statement, um, if, if we ought not to start the MPIC to start the to start the acronym um, right away, uh, that as soon as the um, proposals that end up in the uh, proverbial basket for next time start arriving, that uh, the MPIC, who, whoever or whatever that has to be turns out to be, can begin working on those things. Um, and that it be a kind of rolling process, and that, that there's no particular um, date by which uh, a document has to be done, because there already is a very important and useful document which exists on the, on the website. On the, it's, an, it's an appendix to the master plan, and it's a, the implementation, it's appendix A, implementation matrix. I don't know if any of you have seen it. But it's, it's a list of all the specific recommendations in the master plan with a column uh, that says responsible entities and another column that says time frame. And I've been working th through this, trying to decide who the responsible entity for one per each particular event, or uh, sorry, each particular uh, uh, goal. And uh, those are sometimes pretty easy to figure out, and sometimes you wonder, and sometimes there are five or six different entities that are involved in a, in a particular idea. And then the time frame, of course, is, is another matter entirely. Is this something that can be done in six months, or is this a 10-year time frame? Uh, and they're, they're all there. But going through that implementation matrix is a really interesting trip through the, through the master plan itself. And it, it can give the MPIC a really good place to start and, organize, and a, a way to organize its work by going through that and say, saying, okay, who's responsible for this idea? Uh, the planning board is. Okay, well, how do we do it? How does the planning board do it? Or town council's responsible. How do we get to town council and, and remind them that, that this is their responsibility? That seems to me the goal of the, of the master plan implementation committee, to figure out how to implement this and figure out, more importantly, who's responsible for implementing it and to sort of prod those people, prod the department in, in town or the, the board in town or whoever is in town that needs to be working on that. Maybe some non-town entities like the bid are involved in this. And I think some of the bid is involved in this in some cases, and I think we need to prod them. Um, um, so I suggest that maybe we ought to start the MPIC sooner rather than later. And I also suggest that the planning board take the bull by the horns and appoint it. Uh, I understand that the previous one was appointed by the select board, when we had a select board, um, and that that, uh, for various reasons, never quite got off the ground. Uh, and that may be a mischaracterization of what happened, but I wasn't involved with anything in town government at that time, so I didn't have any idea about it. Um, but, it, it, Christine, you correct me if, if, I'm, over, if I'm misstating that. Uh, the way that began. But in any event, um, is that right? So um, the select board was asked to create the MPIC, and they did actually create it, but I think there was a lag in the time frame in which they did that. And then by the time they finally did create it, um, planning board members were kind of tired of talking about the master plan, so no one volunteered to be on the MPIC. And so it sort of faded away into memory. 
Um, well, um, maybe that's even more reason to start it now because if we wait till after we're finished with this, with the review, the light review, we may all be tired of it then too, uh, and this may happen all over again. Chris, so I just wanted to note that um, if we were to dive into the matrix right now. There may be things there that have already been done or things Indeed, that we feel like we don't really want to do anymore. So I think part of the update is to decide, are those things still viable and do we still want to do them? And so to have a group that's kind of launching into making, you know, taking action steps to make those things happen when we don't actually know if we want to do it or not may be premature. So I'm just saying that putting the MPIC at the end of the process makes sense to me because then you actually have things that you know you want to do. Maybe the MPIC can be, could begin working on, say, you know, section four after you have made your, your go through and say this has been done, this hasn't been done, this we need to work on, uh, and do the, do the edit, the light edit that you're talking about. Having, and then as part of that, you'll probably mark two or three things for future consideration at least as I understand what your process is gonna be. And at that point, it comes to the planning board and we sign off on the changes that you've made and accept the fact that there are things that we're gonna be working on later on, but at that point, the MPIC can start working on those things that are later on, which wouldn't get in the way, I think, of what you're talking about as your, your basic work. Does that make sense? It does. Um, I'm thinking about how all of this is gonna be managed and if we have a master plan update process going on and also an MPIC process, and we're also gonna have zoning bylaw rewrite, and then we also have these other things that we're working on, are we taking on more than we can handle? Maria? Um, I think that, Michael, what you're saying about the MPEC makes perfect sense, um, but it is gonna be a moving target for a while, and we want a lot of public input, and the great thing about this website is <clears throat> we can actually tally it and see what items keep coming up the most, and that might help drive the priorities for this MPEC mm -hmm. group as far as what to tackle first or what to put more interest, or, I mean, sorry, um, consultants or money or time or staff. So I think this process, this update, is actually going to be very revealing for the MPEC's sort of next steps. So I think forming it too early, like Chris said, is a little, um, <clears throat> little uh, too early just as far as being effective, you know, with their time. And um, I guess, I didn't know that. Can MPEC be people who are not on the planning board? Is that right? Yeah. It can be, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, there's, there's no statutory uh, no. concern. Of con there's not, it's not mentioned anywhere in the statute. That would be great, because I and think I, we will be exhausted, I, and it'd be great to get fresh right. eyes on I, this. Yes, but I think we should own it. I think we should, it should be a, it should be a committee of the planning board. I don't know, Chris, you need to check on that on our power of subcommittees. It was my understanding that we can only have our own members on a subcommittee. And if you have other people, then it has to like be treated like all the other committees and you have to have the whole like of the, the form and the um, be appointed by the town manager and charges and uh, terms. Um, yeah, so it, it is a more complicated issue. And so I, I'm just going to say, um, yeah, but it, there's a bigger thing that trumps the, the actual forming of a committee. It's part of open meeting law, which, it, Chris, you can check on that with the town manager and stuff. But it's because I've been on other committees where the same thing has come up. Um, and I remember in the formation of the TAC, the whole thing we were supposed to have a parking subcommittee, and it got killed because of this whatever Chris is going to go find out. There were reasons and complications. But and I'm just speaking as the chair. I do worry about having too many pots on the stove at the same time. You know, the MPIC, you know, I'm hoping I have enough energy at the end of this that I want to be involved in that. But I start to worry doing that right now along with updating. And like I said, I want that to be done well and be a win. And we have zoning subcommittee that will have its work too. 
and then to have third, it, it just starts, I feel it's a little cart before the horse because back to the public participation, how I'm looking at this, Chris had talked about a forum, we're talking about websites, we're talking about collecting all the comments as we move through the process, and then, great, you have all these comments, and then you have to um, sort them and prioritize them, and hopefully, there'll be areas that are shown that need to be addressed. Um, I, I just think it's too much. It, it, at least can we table this and get this process rolling and then see how we feel in a couple of months? Well, like I said, it was just a suggestion. And, and yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not making a motion to that effect. Uh, I just want to underline the importance of the MPIC that it's something that we really I, have I, to I, get we to. All agree. And I think mm -hmm. it's very important that it be a creature of the planning board somehow. I don't know whether it means we yeah. just, we are, it's can just I, us well, plus everything Janet, or, whether we'll we can, or whether we can appoint other people. I don't know how that can work. So it would be well, ideal Chris, to have Can it. you look into what our options are in the power of a subcommittee and what limitations there are with that? And then if there was actually, and just check what, again, was the original idea of, because there was some, you know, the select board um, created the charge and created the committee, so. I do have that material. That would be really helpful. helpful. Thank you. And so that we'll continue that. Janet, you have something to add? I, 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 I also want to reiterate that we shouldn't spend 11 years waiting to implement the, the MOPEC. And so if we wait another year, and I hope this process is much faster if it's going to be a lighter process. Um, I would wonder, if Michael, if you could, I mean, in my endless search for information, Maybe talk to Ralph Wilmer or somebody about like what do other towns do with implementing committees? Like, you know, I think it'd be great if it was just a planning board committee and we had a board of advisors that we went when we're talking about transportation. We just, you know, call somebody up and bring them in for a, a talk. Um, I dread the idea of getting hooked into the town manager or the town council selection process. And so I think. You know, we have a zoning subcommittee that does that, and maybe we can do a MOPIC that does that with some advisors and make it sort of easy and not crazy. But can we get more information about what that would be and involve and bring, bring it back to discussion? That'd be Okay, great. Um, David. I think that this material is great, and I'm looking forward to starting it. I'm curious in about a month's time, according to what's the first step? First, what are we tackling first? Step first? Is Ms. Bestrup. First step is on me. I'm supposed <laughs> to take um, one chapter and go through it and um, try to um, update it as much as I can. I have made a start on, I think, the first, well, I don't know, three, three chapters. I've got a list of things that I would mm. put into them and some things that I would take out and things that I would emphasize. What I'm envisioning is that there would be some sort of introductory paragraph that sort of describes in general how things have changed with regard to the particular topic. And then I would go through each, I think they're called strategies, each strategy and look at it and see if it is something that we've already accomplished, because many of them are, or something that we've partially accomplished and we could comment on that, or something that we haven't done anything about at all and evaluate whether we really want to keep this on our list of things that we want to do. And then perhaps at the end have some kind of um, concluding paragraph or pages about where do we go from here. So that's kind of what I'm envisioning. Is, is there a way when you bring that back to us, like half the page is the original language and the other half of the page is the changes? We, we can do both ways, Chris. You can yeah, do markup and then you can. Because the markup stuff is kind of okay, but page great. after page after it kind of does something to my mind. It's a word thing. You can do both. Well, thank, thanks, <laughs> thanks, Chris. And I, I hope that you'll reach out to whoever you need to hear for whatever assistance that you to facilitate it and not swamp you. Uh, yes, Janet. So one of the things I went to the, to the CRC meeting um, on the chart, one of the, the how we work is maybe the easy part because we can talk amongst ourselves. But um, on the on the chart when it goes to the CRC, in the memo from the CRC, it was 45 days or more if the town council grants it. And so I wonder if people could focus on the the rest of the piece because 
you know, my fear is that it'll be 45 days and then it'll be extended and then it goes to the town council and people will start digesting a 100-page plan. And I checked just with Mandy Jo today. She said 45 45 days. is good. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I just want to, mm -hmm. you know. She said 45. I have kind of concerns for that, but at some point we just can't control everything and people, so. That is true. Um, if it's okay, I'm going to move on to item seven, planning and zoning, zoning <laughs> subcommittee report, which do you have more? Okay, we'll count that as done. Uh, item six, old business. A, we have a decision signing. Fun, fun. Unfortunately, I didn't finish the decision. Oh, I was hoping God. to have Mr. I mean, Gerfine's. Okay. <laughs> hoping to have Mr. Gerfine's decision ready for tonight, but I don't have it ready, so I'm. Um, Oh, I'm shame. hoping it will be ready for the February 19th. Oops. Great, more on February oh, 19th. Oh, Riverside Organics, um, the cultu cannabis, growing. Cultu <laughs> cannabis growing. That's right. Yep. There are two. There are so many parts to it, and I want to get it right. Yeah. And yep. Get it right. It's all right. We're not sad. All right. Item seven, new business. We already covered um, that. Unless there's something else that has not been. Okay. Why did I know that? Yep. UMass is going to launch into a project to um, dredge their pond. Mm. So I have a report about that. Um, I only have one copy, but if anybody wants to borrow it and read it or come into my office and read it, you're welcome to do that. Um, it's, it's a big deal. They have like three feet of silt at the bottom of the mm -hmm. pond that they need to um, excavate, and they're, they've lost their stormwater uh, detention capacity as a result of that. <laughs> And, um, you know, the water quality is affected and everything. So, anyway, if you want to read it, I've got it, and I'm willing to lend it out. Good times. We'll all be lining up. Are we, are we going to be discussing it here? No. No, they're required to send this to us, but we're not required to discuss it. Um, item 8, Form A, a and R. We do have a Form A. Um, oh. We have one for... West Street. It's at the intersection of West Street and Shays Street. So West Street is 116 going south. Um, it's um, just as Shea Street peels off to the east, um, there's a house uh, owned by a former um, uh, reverend. Um, she used to be the, the reverend of the First Congregational Church. Donna Scopper is her name. And um, she and her husband own this property, and it's a really big property. There's a house on it. They don't live there anymore, and they would like to um, peel off a, a property to sell for someone to do something with. So um, we'll, we'll show you the location. We have a location map, and then one of us will bring this around and show you what they're planning to do. I will pass around the location map, and you'll see where this property is located. It's really between the, what river is that? It's probably the it's Cross River. Fort River? Yeah, yeah. Fort River down there? Yep. So it's between the Fort River and Route 116. This is north? No, north is this way. What's this say? No, no, north is that way, yeah. Yeah, right. north is this yeah. way. So you're heading Toward north, Shea yes. comes in, and it, it's this. There's, I sort of remember the metal guardrail, yeah. so next time you go, you'll go, ah, oh, it is. It goes steep way down. So this is the part they want to take off and sell, right? Yep, they want, and I like this, the inhabitants of the town. Sounds kind of big back there. They want to sell the back piece? Or? No, it's no, this, this this piece right here. They want to carve off. Oh, that's and that's the neighbor. And this is the neighbor. Almost have enough to make two lots. I know. It looks like it. I think, like I was saying, this is a drop off here. That's there's there. a guardrail. That's the, that's the different piece. Um, there's no there's no frontage there. Oh, Thirty. I'm a completely misreading. Three there. Oh, yeah, look at 300. It's, it's, it's massive. 300 square feet. 300 yeah, see, this is 160, so even this is, one is, is yeah. It is for two lots. Yes, yeah, so that would be really, yeah. thank you very It's much. probably a topography issue because uh, well, it really drops. Well, if they could get one driveway down, they could get the. 
they but can, can they get two building circles? I don't know. Chris would know. Side by side. They well, they may. Is there wetlands? Is there trees? My guess is that they're going to sell both the lots, that lot with the house yeah. on it, and the other lot, and then whoever buys the other lot will determine what can be done with that lot. And I yeah. think it is possible to subdivide it to make front, more frontage lots, possibly some flag lots, but that's not something that they want to get involved in at this time. They so they're just. Sell the Sell the problem to somebody else. Yes, that's yeah. what it sounds like. Yep. Want, yeah, because it will be. So the possibility. Yeah. You could put it that way. Nicely done. Because it drops <laughs> down and then there's this. <laughs> Looks straightforward to me. Somebody Everybody a good? Yeah. I don't know okay. why you guys are insulting me. Who's insulting you? <laughs> be nice. Play nice in the sandbox, please. Okay, so now uh, is that it for ANRs? Okay, we'll go to item nine, upcoming ZBA applications. Pam, do you know of any upcoming ZBA applications? Uh, 10, upcoming SPP, SPR, So the one I know about is um, this one uh, that is on Bay Road. It's a um, property that is owned by Jeff Brown and his son Jack, and it's um, up the hill getting towards the mountains. They own properties that kind of climb up the hill and they want to create one lot way in the back. And in order to do that, they have to extend an existing common driveway. So the um, zoning bylaw talks about what you're allowed to do with the length of a common driveway and, a, and the steepness of a common driveway. And if you want to deviate from that, then you have to come and get a special permit from the planning board. So um, you'll be seeing this on March 4th. And we'll probably want to take a site visit unless it's um, very snowy or something like that. So I'll be in touch with you about that. Has that property come to us before? Yeah. That property has come to you as an ANR, okay. um, and okay. it's gone to the to the ZBA. I think the ZBA has granted a special permit for flag lots to be created there to be built on. But in order for them to actually be built on you have to um, give the special permit for the driveway modifications. Okay, thank you. Um, any others? There are always things <laughs> out there in the wings, but nothing that's been submitted. Great. Um, we'll move on to planning board committee liaison reports. Um, Jack's not here, so I'll skip that one. Um, Michael, did any of yours meet either? Yeah, Community Preservation Act Committee is uh, in, the, in the end stages of its deliberations about the proposals for this year. We, right. are, we have a meeting tomorrow, which probably will finish up the, uh, uh, the process. And um, I was just going to ask you at the same time, Design Review Board, did um, they meet? Design Review Board has not met. Okay. Did the Ag Commission meet, David? Yes, and oh. it was an amazing meeting. It was great, and there were two two things that um, <laughs> were I thought uh, uh, relevant for the planning board in my mind. One is that there there was a, a presentation about pollinators, um, butterflies, and birds, encouraging among others, and that solar farms and are actually are often inviting site for pollinators, especially since there's a lot of space within the solar farms that are kind of just allowed to grow. Wow. <laughs> and, and, and that uh, it, it occurred to me during the meeting that a possible condition on future solar farms is to encourage pollinator development. And then there are standards and societies and cool. And the second thing that seemed relevant, um, there was a presentation about trying about the ebb and flow of community gardens in Amherst and now we're in an ebb period and there are fewer than there had been previously but one of the things that um, was suggested was when considering the development of new residential space that the green areas potentially could be resident garden plots if there are and that that's something that you might want to encourage in future um, applications. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and zoning subcommittee, we're done, so we'll move to item um, 12, report of the chair. I just want to say welcome, Doug Marshall. Thank you for joining us. Um, 
Sorry this first one was kind of long, but we're really glad you're here and reach out to any of us if you have any questions or concerns or want to like find something that we may or may not know. But. <laughs> um, probably up to three of us. But <laughs> um, report of staff. Um, I have no report. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no. It's, okay, so do I hear a motion for adjournment? So moved. Second, someone awake? Okay, all in favor? Great, done. Thank you. Amherst Media, thank you very much. 10 16.